Please stand for the pledge. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Lori, can you do roll call, please? Yeah. John Aldrich. Here. Brian Burns. Here. Francis Bach. Here. Del Collum. Here. Rick Drew. Here. Susan McGraw Keeper. Here. Um, Bill Taylor. Here. And Susan Vorpel. Here. Okay. Like Jim Grimes. Jim Grimes. Here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on to public comment. Uh, we'll start off with Sarah Davison. Thank you, everybody. I'm Sarah Davison from the Friends of Georgia Capon Foundation. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, and I'm happy to speak to you today on Earth Day. And before I start my presentation, I want to congratulate you and commend you for your work to preserve our natural resources in East Hampton Town. And it's, it's a good day to remember all the great things that you're doing. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So, we, go, we need to go back. Fine. So, I just w want to today uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what we've been doing at Georgica Pond, as well as give you some input onto uh, uh, the 2019 work plan and get your uh, authority to start some new projects. So, the the key initiatives that Friends of Georgia Capon Foundation are, are doing to, are all addressing reducing nitrogen and secondarily phosphorus and reducing bacteria inputs into the pond. And these are the key ones, but of course there's a lot going on at the pond and we're doing other things too that are more outside of the trustee jurisdiction, so I won't be talking about them tonight. Uh, but low nitrogen septic system upgrades around the watershed, landscaping practices and buffers, stormwater runoff abatement, dredging, and the aquatic weed harvester. Those are all things that I'm going to be speaking about tonight. So, um, this is the fifth year that the telemetry buoy's been at the pond, a, a program that Friends has been funding in cooperation with the trustees and the Gobler Lab at Stony Brook. So after this year, we will have five years of data, um, and the, the value of the telemetry buoy is, of course, we, as Dr. Gobler told you two weeks ago, we get 24-hour readings. It's not just a hand sample. And now we have five years of data to, um, to look at a after the season. So we're going to sit be sitting down with you and once the fifth year is complete and sort of having a look back and a look forward about you know, what, if anything, we should be doing differently with our monitoring. But we're very, very pleased with the, um, the, the buoy and the great um, uh, facility it has to measure all the water quality parameters that we're interested in. Now, the trustees themselves, of course, are funding the sampling and the monitoring of your water bodies throughout the town, and Georgica <coughs> Pond is one of them. And you see the compiled data by Dr. Gobler and the graphs and the trends, but it all starts with graduate students from his lab uh, wandering into murky waters to take a sample um, and bring it back to the lab and, anal and analyze it. So the buoy data is complemented by the groundwork monitoring that you are all funding. Another long-standing monitoring project at the pond is the Pond Gauge, and this is a partnership with the Friends, the Village of East Hampton, and the USGS, the U.S. Geological Survey. 
And this monitors the level of the pond. And we, we have many, many years of data of this. And this is very, very useful and very interesting data uh, to see how high the pond gets um, over the course of a season and also year over year. Um, so uh, I don't know if it's picking up any um, sea level rise uh, indications yet, but I'm, I'm sure it will. Uh, so the first uh, thing I want to just discuss with the board is the aquatic weed harvester. Here's a picture of the cutter head hauling up Clodophora, which is a filamentous green algae that has plagued the pond. Um, they, talk of, they call it a macro algae. And other macro fights that are plaguing the pond uh, includes sago pondweed and the perfoliate leaf pondweed. So the Aquatic Weed Harvester has operated for three years. Um, Dr. Gobler has found some fascinating uh, information. We've learned a lot about the pond from the harvester, what, what material it's harvesting, what the bycatch are, and uh, what other uh, species are living in the pond. But uh, after three years, the uh, authorities, that is the DEC and the town, have asked for more baseline data on this project. So, we will not be able to operate the harvester this year because we'll be seeking DEC tidal wetlands permits and town permits um, so that we can operate in future years. And in order to get more baseline data, what uh, I need to propose to you tonight is some more um, sampling and studying of the pond. And this is um, a picture of Dr. Brad Peterson's boat. It's a small skiff with a 9.9 .9 horsepower motor. And as you may remember, doc, Dr. Brad Peterson, who is at Stony Brook Somas, just like Dr. Gobler, has done two years in the past of fish, crab, and invertebrate studies for us. So we've, through his work, we've learned a lot about the size class of the crabs and what species of fish are in the pond and, and new information about the invertebrates, the damselflies, the dragonflies. Um, but uh, so we want to repeat that because the DEC wants to have a more robust data set on that. But we also need to do a more quantitative sampling of the aquatic vegetation that is not in the, in the absence of the, the harvester. So Dr. P Peterson, we'd like to propose, to, would do um, an aquatic plant survey and mapping this summer on the pond. And in order to do that, both the fish and crab study and the vegetation mapping, he needs to use this boat, and we need your permission for that. Now, another uh, key uh, uh, approach to uh, helping the pond is dredging. And this is a picture of the upper reaches of Cove Hollow, of, of Georgica Cove, excuse me. This is uh, the end of Cove Hollow Road here. And, um, I'm told that used to be a real lover's lane in the old days, but uh, it was before my time. Anyway, um, this shows you how congested the upper cove was with Phragmites. And um, so we started a planning study, took quite a few years to get to the point where we are today with a DEC permit and trustee authorization. And the first thing we did was do just manual hand cutting of the Phragmites there to clear the channel, but the, the purpose of the overall project is, was to deepen the channel to improve tidal flow. Sarah, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Any word with regards to Drew Bennett checking the integrity of the pipe that goes from the farmland to Cove Hollow? Have you heard anything? Yeah, that's an ongoing study now that the town is funding. The village <clears throat> kick-started that with using Drew. Um, they did uh, put I wasn't prepared to talk about that tonight, but that's, that's fine. Um, they put underwater cameras through the length of that pipe. It's a very long pipe, and they've discovered some obstructions and problems, and particularly problems with the DOT and the road gravel filling okay. up the, you know, so there, there's a study going on, and we'll talk about that on another well, evening. That's fine. The only reason I brought it up, because it's such a culprit, in my opinion, yes. to what's going on uh, with road runoff, oil, gas, whatever is on the street uh, uh, will end up in the pond via that pipe. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. 
So that pipe is draining right into that uh, the head of the cove. That's why mm -hmm. it, it triggered that in Brian. So the first step after cutting the Phragmites, we hired a contractor to try to dredge out the roots and the sediments underneath the Phragmites stand. And that happened last fall. And it was uh, only partially successful. The, the, their technology was not up to the task. And they were only successful in dredging out the Phragmites roots. You can see how robust these roots are, even if you know, they're underwater. But uh, the, the, the objective of the project was to not only dredge out the roots, but the sediment underneath it, because there's a lot of um, phosphate in that sediment. And you know, we wanted to get that out. So this year, with your cooperation, uh, we've hired another dredger who has uh, more powerful equipment, and we'd like to do uh, another shot at this, a micro dredging of the cove to get the sediments out. And uh, we'd like to request that that can get done right before the trustees open the pond uh, in October. OK, so that's dredging. Now, the, the other new project I'd like to bring to your attention is an experimental oyster introduction at Georgica Pond. Now, back in the early 90s, the trustees had asked a, a guy named John Aldred, who was the head of the town's shellfish hatchery at the time, to um, do a little experiment with oysters in Georgica Pond. And John did that and um, wasn't successful, but there are probably some good reasons for that. And what we'd like to do uh, under Dr. Gobler's leadership and his graduate student, uh, Mike Dole, is try another uh, go at introducing, uh, on a very limited basis, some oysters into Georgica Pond. And how long do how long you plan on this experiment going on? Well, uh, it would be the one year first to see. <coughs> it would be from May, I think my slide says May to September, um, and of course then pending what the results you know, would were. Would you try and overwinter over them in the pond, or would they be taken out? Let's you know, Francis asked me that the other day, and I put that question up to Stony Brook, but uh, I didn't hear back from them. But their work plan says May to um, September. So um, those are the trays that uh, oysters uh, would be, uh, some of the oysters would be uh, kept in. And the proposal is that uh, Oysters would be located in three locations at three different s salinity gradients. The first location would be at the north end of the pond. The second would be in the mid reach of the pond. And the third would be in the lower pond where it's most saline. So we would be able to have a comparison of how the oysters do at different salinities in the pond and um, see if the environmental benefits of introducing oysters could be a short-term um, you know, a help in uh, improving water quality at Georgia Capon. Uh, in the packets I sent, um, uh, we have a letter from Barley Dunn in support of this. And Dr. Gobler and his student have talked to many uh, uh, ecologists and um, marine biologists about this project. Um, it is interesting to note that they think that Meacox Bay is one of the best sites for oysters on the east end. So, and that's a very fresh uh, body of water as well. So it's an experiment. We'd like to see if it's successful. And then we would bring it to you and see whether it merits continuing. Yes, John. Um, I'm assuming you'll be getting the oysters from the hatchery? Yeah, um, either, either the East Hampton hatchery or um, it's uh, South Hampton hatchery. I, I can't, would you, I mean, do you care? <laughs> you want East Hampton oysters? Uh, I, I can make sure that that happens. <laughs> yeah, the other question is, will they be juveniles or adults? Yeah, they will be uh, juveniles. And, and of course, you know, predation is an issue. There are a lot of issues to work out, but... Um, <laughs> They'll all be caged? They'll all be caged, yeah. Some will be in the, uh, the ones that I showed you, and some will be in a different kind of cage that's in a proposal that Mike wrote up for you all. So how are you going to determine predation um, if they're caged? Well, I would think they would, ha they would have the count of how many are there and then how many are, are living and how many aren't. 
but that doesn't necessarily indicate predation. Right, right. They, I mean, they would look. Pro I'm way out of my depth right now, so. Um, Me too. <laughs> okay. You know, we we can get back to you about how they would be measuring predation versus other mortality. Um, I'm sure they have an answer for it. I personally don't. Okay. Um, so. And the only other thing to note is that the north and the south locations are going to be tethered to docks, and the middle one is going to be on a, a mooring. Uh, so that is for your consideration. Now, look at that. Look at that picture. So the next project that's very active that I want to bring to your attention that a number of you are aware of, and it relates to Brian's question, is another of the really uh, obvious targets of stormwater runoff to the pond is from Route 27 at the rest stop up at the head of Talmadge Creek. And I just threw in two pictures here of the rest stop. This is where people launch canoes and kayaks. And you can see it's, it's pretty beat up and eroded. And then here is the next year, someone put some green astroturf down. But what I want to call your attention to is all this foreign white sand that's here. That's all runoff from the highway. And with that comes you know, heavy metals, um, organic compounds, and bacteria. <laughs> so uh, Friends has um, funded the first step of this planning study. Uh, in collaboration with the New York State DOT because it's their property. And uh, we have a little group. Jim Grimes is representing the trustees on it, but we've got the town, the village, the DOT, the, um, and, we're, and um, the town board. And we're talking about how to ameliorate the runoff so that nutrients and bacteria don't enter at this uh, site. And it can be you know, a fairly simple, small uh, action, but because it, it's a very small and constrained site, but it could make a significant difference. And then a secondary goal of the study would be to um, improve public access here, because obviously it's not particularly attractive. Now, so that takes care of uh, stormwater abatement. And then uh, a very long-term big project is the campaign around the pond to get homeowners to upgrade their septic systems to the new low nitrogen septic systems. And this is a, one of the Fuji clean tanks. It's a, a large one that went into a home last year. Um, and it will, um, you know, when, when functioning up to, up to speed, will reduce the amount of nitrogen leaving its system by 70 percent. And this, this system uh, at this home is, is a great one because they not only put in a Fuji clean tank, which, uh, but they connected it to a shallow drain field. Um, so the shallow drain fields work very well in getting rid of the last remaining nitrogen. Sarah, how many, uh, to date, how many actual yeah. systems do you have installed or, or in the permit process right. along Georgia? Right. Well, um, of course, you know, we don't have them installed, but the homeowners do. There are four in the ground, and there are about 20 in various permitting processes. So, you know, it's slow. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's 75 pond front homes, and then there are about 300 in the two-year travel time. So that's my target is 300. Um, and, you know, it's is a real startup process and it takes, you know, each homeowner has to be convinced to do it. Are any of them voluntary or are they mostly in connection with variances? These have all been voluntary. Oh, no, one of the, was that guy voluntary? Um, the, I think they're actually all voluntary. I was questioning one of them, but. So at this rate, it's about 30 years, you expect. Well, you know, that's the what the county's speed, time. At the same speed as the water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, and Suffolk County's timeline is 30 years, but I don't want to be on Suffolk County's timeline. You know, I think after these first few years where it was very tentative and people weren't sure they worked, I think people are starting to understand that they are and there are more systems being approved. Um, and, you know, some of these homes have quite a few septic systems that they would do all at once. So, you know, we, it, things may, let's hope things pick up. Well, thank you. All right, and then. Just a word about Jim Grimes' favorite subject, vegetative buffers. 
Um, these are very important also in intercepting nutrients from leaving people's lawns and entering the pond. Here's a particularly good example of a native vegetation buffer on the west side of Georgica Pond. You can see that there's some native trees left and there's dense growth of milkweeds and uh, solidago and grasses uh, and a, a nice dense growth. Very attractive in my mind and, and an effective uh, buffer uh, to the pond. And so we've reached out to every homeowner to encourage them to develop buffers like this. There are about five or six that still have lawn going straight to the pond. And those are our targets, uh, you know, to try to get them to uh, create um, a, a good vegetated buffer. Okay, and then, so just in summary then, unless there are other questions, uh, we're proposing two new projects this year, all of our ongoing work, but one is the um, oyster experiment, and I see I misspoke, they're proposing May to November mm -hmm. to, to carry out that, and then the, the other one is to continue the fish and crab uh, study, but also add a vegetation's uh, inventory and mapping. Um, so that is my presentation. I have a, a new little card. Uh, we just printed up about the friends and what our goals are and what we're doing. I'm happy to answer any questions and then turn it over to you, Francis, if you want to. Who, Sarah, who's, did you say you had a new dredging operation that was proposed to do that? Right, to sort of Who finish the job. They're, they're, it's a company called Marine Network LLC. They're out of Riverhead. We've met with him a couple of times. He's done this kind of project, a finer, smaller project, and he's done a lot bigger projects too. A couple of the board have met him. So when do you need permission, when do you need these permissions? Well, um, you know, I'd like to as soon as possible because Dr. Peterson wants to start in June and uh, for the, yeah for the surveys. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are we are we going to get any kind of an outline of the projects that we're authorizing? Or? I did send um, to the pond committee uh, detailed plans on all of this. Um, okay. John, I'd be happy to send you another one. Or, I mean, I didn't send you one other than. Okay. We want to vote, on this. We we want to vote on this tonight or hold it over until the next I meeting so everybody's got a chance to read the perspectives. We all got a chance to look at the details. All right. Sarah, will that work with your schedule? Um, so what are we, eight, we're Earth Day today, April 22nd? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in two weeks, I'm, I think that'll be tight, but that'll be fine. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think three. you can pretty much. It'll be a short thing. The next meeting's three weeks, isn't it? Is I think it you're right. It's three weeks. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to see the, you know, the, the oyster experiment personally is less important to me. The um, invertebrate and uh, vascular plant study is key to the permitting for, for, for getting back on track with the, with the weed harvester for next year. It's also similar to what you've been doing the past few years. Yeah, the only yeah. thing new on Dr. Peterson's exp work is the addition of the vegetation sampling as opposed to, you know, okay. the fish and the I, I, I'd like to, because of that, I'd like to make a motion that we vote on the, um, on extending the scope of Brad Peterson's study to include the plants. Okay, it's not a big reach. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important think so to keep right. to get that Continuity. survey yeah. on track at the beginning of the season. We really need that for next year. Okay, I would uh, second that. Second. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, and the other one, we, come, we can we can look at and vote on. I don't mind if yeah. we vote. I just like to look at the details. Yeah. If there's mm -hmm. any input that we have. Um, I think we could do it after the fact. I don't yeah. think it's going to be a it's yes or no. Can we all get a copy? Well, yeah. yeah. Pond, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, less familiar with the, the oyster study. The you know, oyster study is probably Brad, a Brad Peterson study. Brad Peterson's work is sampling. Yeah, and we've you know, been doing that for and a while. And we've been doing that. This is this is nothing new. Sarah, is it possible to let the folks that live around Georgica Pond to remind them 
about not over fertilizing. Oh, uh, they just came out with a whole thing on that. Right, um, and that goes for uh, all of East Hampton. Of course, uh, It's yeah. ridiculous the amount of fertilizer uh, that is being put uh, on the lawn. And uh, you, know, you can also get your soil tested for a few dollars from, um, help me out guys. Cornell. Cornell, Cornell. extension. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's important. Yeah, right? absolutely. And that's, we, that's, we as trustees just signed um, a letter of support a few weeks ago for the low nitrogen fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And I, um, we, a few days ago, met um, the uh, Steve Engelbright. Yeah. I spoke to him about it. So, yeah. Yeah, no. The, so hope that the passed. irrigation and the fertilization is key. And, you know, we send out monthly newsletters oh, good. to talk to people about all these things. So, excellent. Yeah, I signed up. So we can get all right. Well, I get, I'll see you in three weeks then. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Sarah. Thank, Thank you for all your hard work. <clears throat> So now we have what, Cy? Okay, up next is Cy Kinsella. It's always impressive, Cy, you know, you find these things, they, Thank you. they, always, they always look important. I just lose everything so easily. No, no, it's just, it's, it's a nice display. Sai. Sai? Yep. Maybe you could also just give the audience a little history. Of course, we know who you are, but bring them up to speed when you're ready. Thank you. I'll do that. Yep. Uh, my name is Cy Kinsella, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I look after uh, Wayne Scott Pond in a similar way to how Sarah looks after Georgica Pond. I feel like Sarah's little brother, uh, and Wayne Scott Pond is, is uh, the little brother to uh, Georgica Pond, and we're always trying to play catch up. Um, we have uh, the covering letter to the information that I've given to you is just a brief explanation as to the formation of our 501c3 organisation. Uh, again, we're uh, following in um, the Friends of George Capon's model, which has been very successful. Uh, and fr from this project onwards, I'm doing away with making all the decisions unilaterally, which has been very efficient and very effective. Um, but now we make decisions as a board uh, with a larger group, which is, uh, uh, which is good because we can get far greater input. I want to concentrate uh, tonight just on one project uh, that we're looking at. And the idea behind this project is to buy us time <coughs> to do all the other projects. All the other projects are very time consuming. Um, this project, as far as I'm aware, for this specific purpose, hasn't done, been done in the US in, in this way. It has been done in other parts of the world and has been um, quite successful. Uh, Dr. Gobler did a report, which you're all familiar with, in 2008. Um, from that report, we came up with six um, uh, prongs or individual programs and we're targeting the first one, which is the filtration program. I'll try and go through this quickly. I didn't realise it was going to be such a busy meeting. Uh, Wayne Scott Pond is not a healthy pond at the moment. Um, uh, you, I won't read through all this in too much detail, but it, we have microcystin uh, in the pond. Um, that's probably my biggest concern. We have macroalgae for the first time in Wainscott Pond, which we've never really had before to the extent that we have it, uh, or ha had it in 2008. I'm going to go through this quickly because you've got the information um, and it'll give you more time to read it in greater detail. Uh, 
This is the macroalgae bloom for the first time that we saw in 2018. It, this is the north end of the pond. It goes, it probably ex extends down to about 20% of the volume of the pond, which is a little more on, on surface area. That's a view of it from, uh, from the north end of the pond, and you can see it's the, it's the carpet-like algae that was very similar to uh, um, the Georgica pond. It may or may not be a different species, I don't know. Uh, there it is again and again. You can see there where it extends to, which is not all the way. And this is uh, where it extends there. These, pho these photographs here were taken six days after the set of photographs that you just saw. So this aerial photograph is within a week uh, of all the photographs that, of, the, of the macroalgae. And you can see the extent actually just to here which is about 20% of the volume. Uh, why is it at the north end? It's because that's where the shallow uh, part of the pond is. There's less circulation up there. There's more Phragmites up there. There's less wind, and wind breaks up the, uh, the bacteria and the, um, the algae. Uh, so it, it makes sense that it's up there. It's also, it's also where the water's coming into that pond. That's where whatever surface water feeds into that pond feeds from the north, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so that's, if there's going to be contamination, that's where it's going to hit. Uh, we thought initially that it was being blown up there. But after a close look at all the photographs and comparing it with the temperatures and the rainfall, etc., cetera, um, we think that there's a greater part being played by stratification of the, the, uh, the water columns or heat layers. Um, and that's probably the predominant reason why you have the macroalgae at the shallow end, at the north end. I'm going to qu quickly run through these. These are uh, photographs of that same area of the pond. That's 2001, uh, 2004, 2006. It's as green as green. Uh, that's the, all the microalgae. Microalgae is more predominant in Wainscott Pond, being a freshwater body, than Georgica Pond, which, as you know, is brackish. It's 2006 again. 2007, it's, it's not too bad there, but that's in February. September, it's like pea soup. Uh, it's not too bad, but that's in March. 2012, 2013, green. 2014, getting greener. 15, green, 16, hmm. So, and there we have 2018. Those photographs, none of them had significant macroalgae that I could find except in 2018. I found a bit of evidence in some of the earlier photographs in 2017, um, but it didn't form the carpet. It was just individual strands. Uh, this is a graph that I've been keeping for three years now. It's getting a little busy, but it, it tells the story. Um, 1,035 parts per billion. That's probably one of the highest recorded um, levels of blue-green algae ever uh, on Long Island. Um, at the same time, we had microcystin, which was uh, nearly double uh, the, the drinking water standard. That's the drinking water standard for children, uh, which is 0.3. Uh, and I'll explain why I put that in. You can see down there also, that is where that macroalgae bloom happened in 2008. And it was a precursor to the um, blue-green. <coughs> you can also uh, tell very quickly the comparison between Georgica Pond and Wayne Scott Pond you can barely see it, but those little dotted lines down the bottom, that's Georgia Capon's levels. So that's the comparison. Um, Did that macroalgae stick around or did it disappear? I, I don't know because I didn't have any photographs of it. It's, um, uh, it's, <coughs> it, it ultimately lofts up to the top, begins to die off, sinks to the bottom of the pond, and then, and then contributes to the hypoxic conditions that you get later on in the, in the thing. Simon, could, you know, because we do have a lot of things yeah, going I'm, on I'm here tonight, through. maybe you could get to the, um, to sort of the Filtration. pitch. Filtration, okay. Uh, 
Okay, I'll just touch on this very quickly. This is probably one of my biggest concerns. There's Wayne Scott Pond. That's the schoolyard. Uh, we had microcystin um, at twice the drinking water level. Um, kids which are under the age of six years old playing within 220 feet of Sandy Bridge, which is here, and within 720 feet of the pond. And we all know what little boys like to do there. They like to jump in puddles and uh, go swimming in any lake they can find. Uh, so solving the problem, is, I do think there's a sense of, of urgency. This is the um, Sandy Bridge. Uh, the objectives of the filtration program are essentially to remove the algae. Now, the different streams that you can swap out in the filter have different um, pericities. So they range from seven, uh, five microns to 500 microns. Uh, and you can um, change them and adjust them throughout the season as you see the different blooms and different patterns in the algae. And you can have more than one filter. You can have them in parallel and you can have them in series. Um, there is going to have to be a lot of adjustment because there are lots of variables at play in a system like this. Uh, the other advantage is to increase the circulation of the pond. And that's almost equally important. Uh, we'll be taking the uh, water from the south end of the pond, which is a bit deeper, and putting it in the north end of the pond. Now, this is, we've only got um, tentative permission from the DSU to do this on a trial basis, in a similar way to Georgia Cook Ponds Harvester. Uh, so the trial will be cordoning off the top part of um, Wayne Scott Pond, whether that's five it's, represents that's five the, percent. Is that the north or south end? North end. Okay. Where, all the, where all the problem is. Okay. What sort of volume of water are you going to be pumping, let's say, per hour, per day? Okay. Uh, I'll race through and I've got all those answers at the end of the table. Um, that's what the um, filtration system looks like. There are no chemicals or flocculants or anything like that and no media. Um, Six-inch flange. Uh, operating pressure is about 15 to 150 psi. I prefer to go lower on the pressure. Um, that's one of my biggest concerns, is if there's too much pressure, it'll force the algae through um, the filtration system and it won't be as effective. Uh, more detailed plans. The filtration system is only about two feet wide, nine feet long. The hard stand will be, uh, we'll have room enough for two filters if we want to bring another one in during the pilot program, if we want to put them in series or parallel. Um, you can have up to four different screens. Uh, so the stand will be <coughs> 12 feet by six feet by no more than four feet high. The pericities, uh, they vary. Um, we're looking into the uh, impact on fish larvae and eggs in the pond. Uh, we don't know how many fish are in the pond to begin with. Um, there used to be a lot more than there are now. Uh, I'll let you read through that. This is where we're targeting that range there. And that gives you all the sorts of uh, different diameters or uh, particle diameters um, uh, that you can filter with different processes. Uh, you have different um, influences on the flow rate. That means that this is really trial and error. We don't know how efficient it will work mm -hmm. until we start working with it, because each water body is different. Um, you know, the different species or um, varieties of cyanobacteria. So, I, excuse me, I have two questions that perhaps, um, without looking at this completely, how you mentioned the dimensions of this particular filtration system, and at the depth, the deepest depth of the pond, is this covered? Or is this exposed in the water? And how long does this filtration system, how long is it intended to be in the pond to, to do the experiment? The filtration system itself is on the shoreline. OK, so it's um, not in the water itself. Yeah. The only thing that is in the water, which will be suspended by, um, from a buoy, is mm -hmm. the pump. 
that we are low velocity, very broad intake, mm -hmm. uh, slow down the water, and that'll be okay. close to the surface. Okay, yeah. but so let me, I just want to and get how my, long, uh, well, excuse I'm sorry, me, Jim, I'm sorry, and how, how long would this filtration system be there? What is the experiment time, or is it? For the season. For, just for the season right now. As soon as we can get it in, okay. it's important that we get it in, because the idea is to keep on top of it. Right. You I don't know. want to put in a system that is capable of hitting the worst peak. Mm -hmm. um, you want to keep on top of it. Okay. Sorry. Uh, you are targeting the blue-green algae in the pond or the filamentaceous algae in the pond. What exactly are you targeting with this filter? Could, could I just add to that? How do you differentiate? How does the filter differentiate between harmful algae and benign algae? And is it a size? You know, is, how, how can you? I don't see how you can differentiate between it's, strains it, of algae with a filter. It's very, this, the simple way of looking at it is the harvester, which is, is very successful, I think everyone can agree on that, um, is a device that goes around the pond and picks up the macroalgae as it goes around the pond. <coughs> this is very similar, but instead of having it going around the pond, we're having the pond go through it. You can, but there's a lot more. Okay, Mike, going to tell you. Can so I answer your question? Go ahead. Yeah, the um, you can target different forms of algae due to its size and due to its um, strains, its uh, its pattern of colonisation, etc., with the different porosities of screens. For example, um, microalgae is predominant by far in Wayne Scott Pond more so than in Georgica Pond. Um, so we can target that without targeting... Uh, yeah, but my understanding is, I'm familiar with filters, you're targeting your smallest particulate size. Okay, the larger sizes are captured as well, correct? Yes, that is okay. correct. Okay, my concern with this is very simple. The history, and I can't speak for Wayne Scott Pond, but, but certainly we've watched Georgia Pond long enough that we know that the emergence of the, or the initiation of the Clodophora bloom, which is the macroalgae, mm -hmm. is sort of the indicator that right behind that, you're going to be in sort of the incipient stages of the blue-green algae bloom, which is what you're trying to prevent. My concern here is you're filtering blue-green al algae out of the water and you're going to be sucking up every little copepod, every other little uh, form of, of microbiota that you're, that's the source of food for your fish larvae, which may not matter because you can probably be sucking up the fish larvae too. Uh, I feel like we're, we're, this is something out of Star Wars. We're, we're this friggin' planet that's sucking in every living thing in the pond. And I read some of the, some of the data that you sent on these ponds and the history of these things in places like Australia, but they were trying to get to a potable water supply. This wasn't to control algae in, a, in what really is a natural environment. You want a certain amount of algae. It's when these algal levels reach a point where they generate a toxic uh, byproduct or whatever. That's the issue. My question to you is, why this and not <coughs> taking a pr an approach similar to what uh, Friends of Georgica took with the macroalgae and taking that out of the system along with the, with the nutrients that are bound up in it as a means to um, <clears throat> prevent the pond from, from, from triggering into the blue-green algae bloom. Why, why choose this system? I mean, that, that's, you hit the nail right on the head. The problem is that Wayne Scott Pond isn't Georgica Pond. It's completely different. We don't have, you know, except for, you know, a surface area of, of um, less, a bit less than 20% in one year in the last 10, we don't have a macroalgae problem. We have a microalgae problem which starts very early in the season. Um, and regardless, there might be years where there's no macroalgae at all, but we still have blue-green algae. Yeah, my concern is before I, could, before I could feel comfortable with this, I'd want to know what sort the, of the, the collateral issues would be with this. Well, the, I think I, in answer to your question, I think the most important thing is uh, it's a closed system 
what we're taking out isn't necessarily what we're permanently taking out. We can put back in. So in other words, we can take things out and then sift them, uh, sort them and put stuff back in. It's not, a, it's not a system where you're removing everything and that's it. So it's a pilot, it's a test, everything comes out, we watch it uh, and measure it. Uh, if we see something that's coming out that shouldn't be coming out, well, we turn the thing off. Um, so it, it's, it's something that will always continually change. The filtration system and what you're doing with it um, will change and adjust to the environment. Yeah, because my but concern is you, you've got, basically you've got on the high side a 500 gallon a minute uh, water exchange I, th I think I think it would be more realistic. It's going to be around okay, there, 100 to 300. Like, that's like 12 million gallons a day. No, no you're not going to do that. No, I'll, I'll show you the table at, at the end. We'll, okay. And that's I mean that you, that's my biggest concern. 12,000. You, I'm sorry. If you do what if you do what Georgia Cup Pond are doing in Wayne Scott Pond, I don't believe it would work because it's a different problem. Um, in fact, I can tell you, it's, you're almost guaranteed that it won't work, because you know there's, you can drive a, a harvester around and you won't be picking anything up. Uh, so you know we've got to look at something else. I, I, I agree with you. I'd much rather use something that's been tried before, uh, and we, it's a known quantity. But we don't have that luxury. For the pump. That's that's the likely. Um, a test area, uh, and that's a zoom up of it. Uh, we're talking volume. The test area is about uh, two uh, million gallons. Uh, this is just a, it gives you a, um, a flow. The flow will be picked up from the uh, south. The water will be deposited in the north, creating a, a flow around the test area. You'll be able to change the test area as well. Uh, we can spoke about this. Okay, so this is getting to what you were talking about, Jim. Um, these are the various different um, uh, sizes of test area. And at 5%, you have the volume at 2 million gallons. Uh, and these are the turnovers. So this is really the, the, the most important graph, and that is if you're going to have a turnover, say, of 10 days, that is, you're turning over the whole volume of the pond in 10 days. If you remove, say you've got a 300 micron uh, screen on, and you're going to remove, uh, as one study did, 26.1%. That's the, the example cited in the report. As you correctly pointed out, most of these things are going and taking the water and using it for something else. Uh, it's going into further treatment, UV, uh, water and golf courses, whatever. This doesn't do that. This is a closed system, so it goes back into the pond and gets <coughs> lifted again. So you run it through three, three times, or turn over the pond three times, and the pond, all other things being equal, is going to be fairly clean of what you're removing. The key is, as you correctly pointed out, is what are you removing? Uh, so that turnover day there is 10 days. With those numbers at 33, um, you, can, uh, you clean the pond in 30 days. And given certain term, turnover parameters with the porosity of the screens, the gallon rates, you need one, two, and six filters to do that. So it's something that once you have it there, you have to play with it and get it right. And it's, it's not, an, I don't think it's going to be an easy thing of getting it right. But when you do get it right, it's going to be a very powerful tool. And the beauty is, it is something that will uh, be working throughout the whole season and it will have an immediate impact on the pond. You see, it, it's, it is a temporary solution, it's a band-aid solution. But the whole idea of it is it's designed to buy us time to put everything else in. And that's the beauty of it. That's pre-screened in effect. Yeah, it's, it'll have eliminate large objects, larger objects. Exactly. What's um, the what's the mesh of that screen, and um, how how do you how are you going to monitor that and clean that? 
it's, it's going to have a broad intake close to the surface. Uh, close to the surface, um, the screen can be changed and will be monitored. Remember, Wainscot Pond is not very deep, and it's not very big, especially in the test area. What's Someone the can mesh? walk. What's the mesh of that? It will have varying meshes. So On we'll, that main intake, we'll be able to change the meshes. So it'll be a broad mesh um, to keep large fish, but the low velocity will be such that fish will be able to swim away from it. Um, you know, I can't see a problem of, it's not like a vacuum cleaner where you're trying to suck everything up. Uh, it'll be taking the water in slowly and be very closely monitored. Can I ask a quick question? Um, you're the science behind this the yes. project. Did you say the DEC was on board with it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. We've been work yes, we've been working with the DEC on so that. The they were the ones that have suggested the, the core not, off area. Not to take away from all your hard work, because mm. you certainly do a lot of hard work. I mean, are they <coughs> asking uh, for, you know, like a Dr. Goldblatt to sign off on this? Um, oh, of course. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, you the, say, whole, the, whole point, the whole point of this is to, is to collect the data, is to collect the science. Good. Um, I, I'm confident that it will work, and the beauty you know, as I see it, is it's low impact on the pond. That's, that's the thing I like about it. Um, I can understand the concerns about fish eggs and larvae. Yep. I'm concerned about that as well. I'm more concerned that we're going to get a situation in Wainscott Pond where the oxygen level goes down, as it did a day or two ago in Agawam, um, where he had a large fish kill. Uh, you know, I was on the phone with my father in Australia. They had a huge fish kill in the um, Murray Darling where they needed to get bulldozers in just to clear, the, mm -hmm. clear all the dead fish. I don't want that happening in Wainscott Pond. I don't either. So, again, just so I'm clear, the methodology that you're proposing is that that's not, not something new, correct? I mean, it's, no. it's tested, it's being done, it's been done in other places. Yes, it okay. is being done at other places using different equipment. The idea came to me from someone that is doing exactly this, removing algae um, uh, with a different system, a similar filter system uh, in Australia. Uh, but I'd rather use a US firm, and this firm, it's a good firm. Okay. At what point does this become a system that's no longer needed? That's the ultimate goal, is to have the pond that's free. Absolutely. So how do we get there from here? Yeah. Once this is in and mm -hmm. Dr. Gobler is doing all his measurements, um, then we turn our attention to all the things like changing the cesspool systems. We've already started the dredging program. We have our sample plan. I think Brian is here. Brian? Oh, it's Brian. Uh, it's Brian uh, Grogan from PW Grocer. He's our consulting engineer. Um, we, uh, the sampling plan, is that, has that been approved by the DEC yet? Okay, so um, we're attacking all the different prongs at the same time, mm -hmm. but this, this one is, is the, the one that I'm concentrating on because it, it, has, it will have an immediate impact. And as I said, the biggest concern at the moment is not just the wildlife, it's the fact that if we do get um, a serious um, incident of uh, microsystem. There are kids playing all around that pond. I know two families at the southern end of the pond that live on the pond, mm -hmm. uh, another family that lives on the north end of the <coughs> pond, uh, and you've got the schoolyard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember you know, years ago, I capsized in Georgica Pond. I'm six foot tall. I was sick for two weeks. Uh, you know, if that happens to a little kid, they're going to be a lot sicker. That document you're getting from the DEC, you expect to get from the DEC, will that be their permission for you to be in operation? I'm not quite sure what form it will take, whether it's a permit or it's uh, a document saying that we don't need a permit for the science. So I, I'm not technically sure. Um, Brian might know something on that. No, right now, the, the, what, for the DEC, is just a dragon sample. So it's one of the other... You'll have to come up if you're going to sure. speak so folks at home sure. aren't left out. Thank you. 
No, so what's before the DEC right now? Is Can you the introduce business? yourself? We sure. Uh, it's, uh, my name is Brian Grogan. I'm with PW Grocer Consulting. We've been working with Simon on this project. Um, so the DEC has before them a dredging sampling plan just to go over sampling locations, number of samples, um, to ultimately go forward with a dredging process. Um, so once we get that plan approved, then we can kind of start to potentially come back here and start the process of collecting samples to dredge the pond. Um, as far as the filtration project goes, to answer a couple of quick questions, it's about three quarters of a million gallons a day and that 5% is the flow rate going through the filter. Um, the wire mesh screen, approximately a quarter of an inch in size. Um, and we'll go with the velocity, I think is about a half a foot per second. It's consistent with DEC's requirements for um, cooling water intake structures so that fish can swim away from that uh, intake screen. So the quarter inch screen, what passes through the quarter inch screen will go right to your largest would, screen in your filter? Exactly, which, is about would go, a, a which would be about a 20, yeah, be a 20 micron screen, so. 20 microns yes. is the largest? But that's the smallest one, I think. The largest one, I think, is 100 microns. Uh, actually, it's, it's a lot larger than the <laughs> Yeah. Could you, could you range please explain almost. how this thing's going to differentiate between harmful algae and benign algae? It's, in, in reality, it's, it's not going to. It's not a, it's, that filter is not a smart filter, nor, you know, it's whatever's going to come in. It, whatever makes it is less than 20 or less than the screen size would pass through, and whatever's larger gets stuck on the screen. Um, and then that would be backwashed off the filter. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I personally would like to hear from Dr. Gobler on this before we move forward. Uh, well, I, I didn't expect the, the trustees to vote on anything tonight. Um, I, I'd rather you, you read through it. And uh, Chris uh, wanted to be here tonight, but um, but, but I would still like reasons. to hear from Dr. Gobler. Of course. I mean, right. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was speaking with him today on that. Um, so, any more <coughs> questions? No, I think we're probably good. Think, okay. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank all you your for hard work. All the information awesome. signed. Yeah. All right. Something to read on the beach. <laughs> all right, Steve Borner. Isn't that like a pool? Yeah, I guess. No, that's, that's a bridge. Wait, but could this have to go out so that there's movement? It's going to go down. It's going to go down. It's going to go down. Okay. Waiting. Steve, your report was sent out to everybody, but apparently it didn't get printed. No, I didn't get it. It did go. I sent it first. Not the most recent one. Yes, yeah, it did. There's another one that just yeah. sent out again. I read the first one. I didn't read, read the ones. That Here, I have it. It starts like this. You printed yeah. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did. Steve, maybe you could just okay. take mm -hmm. a brief moment and bring everybody up to speed while you're here. My name is Steve Warner. I was hired by the trustees to investigate the uh, foreshore ownership and a shoal system, including Cartwright Island, uh, adjoining Garden Zone. Great. Thank you. You want to speak into the mic, too? That's it. Really yeah. <laughs> How's this? Good. Okay. You're good. Hmm. Do you want me to yeah, elaborate more, or yeah. do you want to go through it? Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay. So my findings, I worked on this since September of last year, and I, I can tell you that I lived and breathed this case, and uh, to me, there's absolutely no doubt that the shoal system belongs to Gardner's Island, as it always has, even though it wasn't uh, specified in the original deeds and the uh, resultant uh, confirmatory patents and so forth, quit rents over the years and that uh, the foreshore is private, that the public trust doctrine is not a universal uh, doctrine across New York State. The right of navigation, which is a federal right, applies everywhere, 
in the United States. And this report, uh, it's all cited, documented. Well, I don't know what point you're going to release this, or, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. It's all factual. It's all stated. Can, can you go through this and comment on? Yeah. On what? Your conclusions. Okay. If, you can, if you can go down item for item on your conclusions, how you came to the mindset that this is not, this is, this is part of Gardner's Island, and what basically, what substantiated that conclusion? Well, if you read my report, Steve, I cited. Do, do you need help to go th through this? Go through it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you can go through it and comment it as you go. That yeah, way. Except it was just reading the report. We don't need you. I'd like to start with uh, one of the important definitions that I included, which is islands forming part of a landform. And that definition, and this is uh, international law of the sea, shallow, it's islands that are so situated with respect to a characteristic land formation, such as a headland, which but for the intervening water areas would be part of such formation. So to me, we don't know in 1639 when Lion Gardner purchased the island from the Indians what the shoal system was like. It could have had various cut-throughs. And then the next year, it could have been filled in. We know that. Um, but I provided documentation. We'll take it chronologically. Number three. So in 1649, Lion Gardner, who was already in possession of this island for 10 years, uh, wrote a letter to John uh, Winthrop, Jr., the governor of Connecticut. And it says, I hear you have gotten sheep. If you have not a com complete English ram, uh, I can let you have one, which would be a great advantage to you. So in terms of looking for historic evidence as to Ram Island's name, I would say that that's a, a good one. And we know that uh, the early settlers used uh, natural boundaries like water bodies as um, pens for their animals. And then sometime in the 1650s, I don't have a date on that, but Windanch, uh, the Montauk Sachem, died in 1659. Uh, he talks another letter, talks about sheep husbandry in Montauk, which tells me that the, in, the East Hampton proprietors uh, were using Montauk, or at least the, the western part of it, for their own livestock needs, not Ram Island. And let me just say something that I, I know the archival material for East Hampton and that island and that family, and I have been working on this. There is no, no evidence of town use of anything on there, nothing. And if anybody wants to say that, you know, periodic trespassing on these shoal systems counts as a custom, which is a broader term for adverse possession, I absolutely disagree with that. As far as uh, the islands or the shoals not included in the language, now I cite the, the various Long Island town patents, uh, the Indian purchases. We all know that Long Island has barrier islands and interior bay islands. They're not mentioned. So it's inferred. I, I did my best to find uh, similar geog geographic and historic references and places to this. Um, to me, Fisher's Island is a big one. It had manorial status, and I have a lease in here from 1705 from the Winthrop brothers who owned the in island in its entirety to George Havens and his son from Shelter Island. They were basically uh, shepherds for seven years. 
and I'll quote that. So within the lease, the terms of the lease were reservations. And also all wrecks of the sea, whales or other great fish, probably sturgeon, uh, which shall happen to come or be driven on such island. And then it also includes all the hammocks, which is hummocks, are likewise intended in the reservation above. So hummocks would be small offshore little islands or, or uh, rocks adjoining it. That to me, that's the same as the Shoal System Gardner's Island. It's the same thing. And again, New York State, same time period. And then in the early 20th century, the Gardner family started leasing Gardner's Island uh, to Clarence Mackey. And in, in that lease, which I cite, he also makes reference of Ram Island about uh, permission to shoot male deer on the island. As far as the issue of the foreshore, I clarify in the beginning of the chapter on that, or the, the section, that there are two distinctions in terms of a private owner, upland owner, having exclusive right of the, the land underwater and the foreshore. Um, the New York State Land Commissioner's Office uh, gave many grants of land underwater and the foreshore to the exclusion of the public. I would say 1880s through the early 20th century. And I cite that. Um, Robbins Island, 1880s, a uh, group of sportsmen owned the island. They asked for a 500 foot belt of land underwater around the island. Local oystermen protested, they got 200 feet. And that's 1880s. So to me, you're going to challenge something from the 1600s. You know, including this, these townships. You know, these people bought this land from these Indians. They carved a civilization out of these places. Every year, New York Colony shoved the rifle in their face and said, pay us quit rents, the bribery. Right up to the revolution. And the revolution, after that, the New York State Constitution of 1777, Article 35, honored those early land terms. And that includes East Hampton's patents, and Gardner's Island. Gardner's Island is private. They've never conveyed a square inch of their land to any private entity except the northern tip of their shoals to the U.S. government for a lighthouse. And the U.S. lighthouse paid for that. You cannot convey what you don't own. Well, yes, you can. But, uh, you can certainly buy something from somebody that doesn't own it. Um, I have one question. It's about the public trust doctrine. Now, it's my understanding the public trust doctrine um, belongs to the public, the area between low water and high water. And I believe one of the issues that's mentioned as far back in the Magna Carta, which prohibited the king of England from, from giving away, selling, doing anything with the land between uh, low water and high water. So again, you know, what the gardeners got grants of land that said a certain thing, but perhaps the king did not have the right to to grant him that because the king was, you know, I mean, this this is a, I, I you know, waterfront land is crazy, but the public trust doctrine is basically um, in New York law and. We're arguing about what public trust doctrine is, but the land between low water and high water is is open to the public. Well, from my my understanding. Well, again, if you look at this in the binary way that this was presented, is the public trust doctrine universal in New York State? It's not, and it all takes us one example of that to to disprove. And I've given those, so it's really been hijacked. 
about the rights of now, navigation. In, in Shelter Island, which you use as a prime example, look at their town code. That was a memorial status to the Sylvester brothers, and then they, they conveyed to private entities. So right now, Shelter Island's town code is mean right. high water, right. is the upland owner boundary. So right. they, they respect the New York State Public Trust Doctrine. So that's how Shelter Island is managed. To, to me, so, they became a township, unlike Gardner's Island. Well, Gardner's Island could, is part of East Hampton could, Township. Right. They, became, they voluntarily became part of uh, East Hampton Township in 1788, I believe, and gave up right. their manorial status, which meant in a municipal fashion, right? They could have courts, they could have their own church, but their terms of their land re remained. Well, I'm just sharing with you how their town I'm, code is written. And I'm looking, believe me, I'm still looking. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I cite a, an island in the Elizabeth Islands chain up in Massachusetts, which was part of New York Colony at that time. It's still called Duke County. If I may quickly chime in here. You know, Bill, I actually had a little bit of a different look at the public trust doctrine. I did some of my own uh, research on the public trust. One thing that I saw was that, this, especially in New York State, now the public trust, as you mentioned, goes back 1,000, 1,500 years. It's very specific, state by state. It's a working document that's been reviewed. There's case law, obviously, for each and every state. But one thing I saw that was consistent was that the states assumed title to those underwater lands, the tide lands, whatever you want to call them, only to properties that were not granted away by any patent prior to that Ameri the end of the American Revolution. So I actually came to the conclusion on the public trust doctrine, something a bit different, which was that those rights were granted away, just like the Dongan patent gave us, the trustees, the right under that patent to give Gardner uh, you know, the opportunity to buy that land. And when he spoke about that, it was the hunting, the fishing, the timber, the whaling, uh, everything you know, between. And, and I just, uh, you know, it's, for me, it's not really an access rights thing, but from a, from a public trust doctrine standpoint, I actually saw it, uh, I saw it differently, in that uh, that was granted away prior to the American Revolution and prior to New York State taking control. So yeah, but I don't know. It's who, a really, it's who, a really who interesting argument. granted argument. it? The king granted it. And if the king didn't have the right to grant it, it's not well, really valid. How does Massachusetts? Massachusetts, Massachusetts has some interesting laws. They, they treat it the same. Massachusetts has a really cool law that. They go to the that, low tide. Yeah. Well, they. So that. But has New York State? Has, that has New York State? Has New York State Magna ever Carter. granted the beaches of Gardner, the area between low water and high water, to Gardner's Island? They didn't have to, Bill, because it predated to. it. Yeah, exactly. That that's my argument yeah. as well. Now, it's what came before? If first. the king didn't have the right to grant the beach, then then how did the trustees get the beach? Well, we got you know? <laughs> we got the beach, but the question is to where? To the high tide mark or to the low tide mark? I don't. That wasn't specified in the Dongan patent that the right. trustees got. And it's always been that that the area we always consider the area between low tide and high tide to be open to the public, every place. Now let's not talk ourselves out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, I think it was a it was a wonderful report, well researched. I guess, but this it's going to be a, a matter for the courts. I guess, probably not us. Well, again, to me, this is uh, this is all fact based, and you know, in lieu of the language that you know we're hoping to find from uh, the Indian deeds. Now, to me, my methodology is you look at every angle. So the foreshore is where the rubber meets the road. What everything happens on the foreshore, <clears throat> drift whales, which the town broke the town into squadrons from an early beginning to get drift whales. That's on the foreshore. They're not thrown up in the dunes. Seaweed regulation. These are not state issues. This is this town's, and the same thing holds for Gardner's Island. Nobody was going up there and doing things. If they were a trespass, but it was not universal, that would be custom. Did you make any decisions as to whether um, the Dongan patent covered Gardner's Island? Or Dongan They have their own patent. Their own patent. Yeah. So they're basically our neighbors. 
just so everybody understands, we never contended that the trustees had a dog in this fight. This was not our property, but I saw it more as, you know, it was a piece of history. We obviously hired you to research and come back to us. Um, did, in fact, the gardeners own uh, the shawl or not, um, things of that nature. So I just wanted to remind the public that, uh, you know, for the purposes of possible public access uh, or not, um, you know, we, we felt, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, we felt intrigued to find out, and that's why we brought you on. So it's really like a history uh, lesson for us. And as I said back in September, that I, I really hope and work very hard to make sure this document was something you guys could use for your own jurisdiction. And I absolutely feel that it pertains to you as well. The, the thing I would like most people to most grasp about this is that to look at Gardner's Island and look at the town of East Hampton as side-by-side -side municipalities in terms of their land tenure status. That's what I'd like people to understand. Mm -hmm. okay. So what you're saying is the Gardner patent is the same as our patent, right? only it's directed solely toward the Gardner family. Correct. Including the foreshore. Mm -hmm. To tell you the truth, I, I personally think that Gardner's Island possibly even has a territorial belt of land underwater around that island, just as I said Robins Island does. But in terms of in terms of the <laughs> limits of this report, I'm limiting this to the public trust doctrine, the foreshore issue. And I absolutely have not seen anything, anything showing that the public trust doctrine is universal. I've, I've provided examples. 30 years ago, East Island and Glen Cove, uh, 17 surfcasters were issued trespass tickets uh, going along the foreshore. And that went, they were ruled against New York State Court of Appeals by virtue of an 1888 grant from the New York State Land Commissioner's Office for foreshore and lands underwater in Long Island Sound. So, have, did you fall? I mean, whether I agree with it or not is another story, but in, in terms of this, I absolutely believe this. Does Gardner's Island have any of those grants from New York State? I'm sorry? Did the Gardner family have any of those grants from New York State to the foreshore or underwater land? Did they have grants from the state? Yeah. Not that I've seen. Everything is, and I've reviewed the chain of title. Um, there's no, and I cite that, there's no specification of anything. It just recites the same as the original Indian deed and the Dongan Pounds. Wouldn't the fact that the state granted the underwater land to, say, Robbins Island in the 1800s indicate that the state had sovereignty over that land? To the, well, Robbins Island didn't have manorial status. So they had a number of owners. That's an interesting island. Um, it was confiscated. Uh, by the New York State after the revolution because the loyalists owned it. It's not the same, you know, th this is case by case. I can't <coughs> compare everything. I, I looked for islands and particularly islands with the same manorial status, same patents. Robbins Island didn't count as that. Now, because it's in Peconic Bay and the Gardner's Bay are considered arms of the sea, open sea, that's where New York State lays its claim to the, that's, an that's another story. I mean, again, case by case, parcel by parcel. You cannot make, I've told people this a long time, I can't, as an archivist working with land tenure issues for this town, I can't make blanket statements universal across this town. There are nuances between here and Southampton, here and Southhold, and it all comes back to a variety of things, including what parts of England they came from, when they came, whether they took a dong and patent out or not, which patent, I mean, this is how complicated this is. You cannot do this area of law without knowing uh, intimately the, the colonial history for each town. And uh, I, I, hope, I hope I've succeeded uh, in convincing you of this. 
I've, I've tried to poke holes in my report. I've looked at every different angle, and I'm not finding any evidence to the contrary. I have one more question. Did you actually see and read the Gardner patent? I'm sorry? Did you actually see and read the Gardner yeah. patent? Yeah, we have a, we have a copy of that, okay. or an early photostat copy. Okay. And I looked carefully at the language. I know the, the I, I've, I've reviewed several of them across the island, and I know there's some subtleties, but uh, the Gardner's island patent includes beaches, it cites pretty much everything. Again, is it, did it imply uh, the beach, including the foreshore? I absolutely say so, because I say the same thing for East Hampton. I think East Hampton owns the foreshore <coughs> here. Based on the language of the patents. And, and evidence of historic use. Again, drift whales from the very beginning. The Indians understood this concept. Uh, seaweed regulations. Where was the state? This well, is all fact. This is all yeah, cited. For what it's worth, too, you know, I, early on, Stephen, I think I told you, you know, I called Albany with regards to some questions, and they got back to me, and as far as they could see, uh, Gardner's Island was, in fact, the shawl was owned by them, um, and, and that was their contention. So uh, you're not the only one coming to this conclusion. And that was from the state, uh, you know, within, the, uh, within New York State. Uh, again, to me, in the 1850s, uh, the U.S. government bought the northern tip of the shoals. So there's two shoal systems, north and south. The Carver Islands at the bottom of the southern one. They bought that for a lighthouse. They paid as a deed conveying that. <coughs> so I think the U.S. government would, would know who they're buying land from and you know, have attorneys working up this, this agreement. Same with uh, Montauk Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. By the way, that, light, that original agreement goes down to the main low watermark. So there's, there's more to this. Yeah. The more you dig, I think, that, and I'll be honest with you, I, I too never had to really address the public trust doctrine before in the work that I've done. The surveying or coastal cases, I've just kind of assumed, yeah, the public trust doctrine, the Justinian emperor, and I even have a Roman coin from Justinian. That I, I thought, wow, and the more I looked, that it is Roman law is not as uh, well represented in English common law as we think. And in my report, I go, I won't get into it here, but I go back to the Saxon kings. When they, when they granted land or sold land, upland owners with, with coastal properties, it included the foreshore. There was, there was the overreach, the Stuart kings that, that uh, needed money. And that's where, where we live was in that time. It just all happens to be time and space. And so to me, it's a moot point to get into, well, you know, did they have that right? Um, it is what it is. Our, our common law, our cases all cite that. Okay, fine. So therefore, Thomas Dongan, governor of New York, by virtue of the king, had that right then. Hmm. Anybody else on the board have questions? Not at this juncture, no. Thank you. I, think. I mean, clearly we're going to be reading this report between now and the next meeting. Would you be available to answer any questions we come up with? At your convenience? Do what? Answer any questions we might have between now and the next meeting as we read the report. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks Steve. Thank you very much, Yeah, Steve. thank you for all your work. Good thank you, Very Steve. detailed. Yeah. Come. <coughs> All right. Uh, you're on the list. When I get to your name, you can comment. Uh, George Eldy. Okay. I don't need to speak at this time. Okay. Okay. David Talmadge. <coughs> Welcome, Dave. What's that? Welcome. Hello. Oh, thank you. Yep. Well, I should say David Talmadge. And yep. I uh, just wanted to add one thing to our previous speaker there. That, uh, you have to look at the grants that, at the time, back in that time frame, and you have to look at who was 
dealing out the, whoop, stay there. You have to look at who was uh, dealing out those grants, and that was Charles. And things didn't end all that well for Charles. But, uh, <coughs> well, I'm here today. I have a couple uh, things. One is a question. Another is a procedural observation. And the, th the third is a caution. Um, the question is, I, I was on your website. I noticed the agenda is published. And, I couldn't find any links to the trustee minutes. Are they not on your website? They, they were uh, framed out to be put up there. We may be behind in getting them up there, but they are supposed to be. OK, they are supposed to be up there. We, I, we, I didn't know if you were behind and just not keeping up. I believe we have two sets of minutes to be um, approved tonight. Yeah, OK. Um, next, the procedural issue. Um, it's Again, it's uh, the same issue I spoke with you a couple of weeks ago, I, I realized that we weren't all working off the same sheet of music at the time. And you explained to me that the, the private meeting that you had before the special meeting on April 1st was, a, was primarily intended to disseminate information to the trustees and the Well, and I the need folks. to correct you. There was no private meeting well, before the special meeting. All right. Well, and I don't know where you're getting this from. Well, I'm getting that from the fact that I was told not to come into the room because the meeting wasn't open yet, and there were six trustees in there. And you told me at the I, last it wasn't meeting me because that I, you wanted to did, get did the information on this out board to tell the, him the other trustees. The I didn't no. And to me, well, all right. If you don't want to call it a meeting, call it a gathering. David, when I, outside. When if, I you want, if you want to call it a gathering, that's fine. When I but you had a you had a quorum of trustees there. You were discussing public information that is against New York State law. You okay, know, if so you're gonna discuss, when I got there, you were in the hallway. Right. Okay. So there were people already in the room when I got there. A conversation that you had with them beforehand. I was not privy to. We were gathering for our meeting, mm -hmm. and we were waiting for one more person when you were sitting in the room with us. Right, we, were we didn't start the meeting until about but 10 after 6 when we planned to start. But now, when, when I got there, it was like 20 minutes before the meeting. I was told that we weren't allowed in yet, and you had six trustees well, in there. I don't know where that and came you told from. me at the last meeting that the point, or that the purpose of that was to disseminate information Correct. about what you were going to discuss. Well, that was the point of the meeting. The and I, and it, it, it's not that complicated. We can go back to LTV and look at the record. That's was, exactly so what, what you excuse said. Excuse me, was, Dave. So that being said. Well, that being said, I just. Me, I, wait, wait, wait. We both can't talk at right. the same time. Allow me to speak. Yeah. That being said, Dave, mm -hmm. if something was done in, in, in era, OK, let us move on. Well, that's I mean, exactly. Unless, I mean, unless you're. No, that's that's fine. Yeah, okay. But right. I, I, the, the 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 argument was though that you, I, my impression was that you didn't believe anything was done in error. And I just for for your own edification, I brought copies of the New York State Open Meetings Law. If somebody can pass those out. Okay, uh, okay thank you. We will it's look at it. Three pages. It's fairly simple. Yeah, anytime you get a gathering of trustees and it's a, a quorum. That is considered a gathering, a meeting, and if you discuss, you know, public business, it has to be open to the public. Excuse and me. And that, that is my point. And I, I, I don't want to belabor it. I, I'll, I will move on to my next issue. And that was. Can I wait, no, we, 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 can, get, we get a, an ability to, to. We have the right to respond to your questions. The meeting was called for what time? The meeting was called for six o'clock. Six o'clock. All right. I arrived at the meeting, and I sat outside and waited to go in. And in the meeting was Jim Grimes, Susan Vorpal. No, it was not there. You were there. I was waiting outside. Not there. No, that's a different, he's to, you're talking about a different meeting. Oh, a different, OK. Yeah. This was Excuse the me? meeting me that we that had. This is the special meeting okay. we had on Bluff Road. Yes. 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 No, Susan was not there. No, no, but this yeah. wasn't related the, to. The evening that you no, this left tonight. Wasn't, no, no, this wasn't the meeting related to Lazy Point. Okay. This was the meeting that Francis called because it was there was the discussion about um, Albert's Landing, about yeah, pulling the, the pulling the uh, pulling the groin out over mm -hmm. there, the yes. upland portion of the groin. Okay. The town had it on their agenda for the following day to discuss. Mm -hmm. Francis wanted the board to be brought up to speed on this before the yes, town I was discussed there. it, okay. just so that the membership, okay, didn't get blindsided. Okay. So. 
this really was a meeting to just bring the trustees up to speed. There was a quorum of Dave, like you said, there was a quorum of individuals there. There was really no reason to hold anybody outside. Um, I don't know who told you that you couldn't come in, um, but it really didn't matter one way or the other, when or if you came in, uh, you sat through the meeting, you know, you know the meets and bounds of the discussion that occurred there. I don't think there was any malicious intent or anything there. And quite frankly, Dave, I don't know why anybody would have said don't come in. Because no, I don't either. Now, this, like I said, this was just a procedural issue, and I just wanted to bring it to your attention and caution you because it, it looks bad and it reflects poorly when, when people think that there being something's going on. I, I don't honestly think there was anything going on because I don't think the issue was that significant. No. And you no. really, I don't think you've have you even done anything on the, the. Thank you for saying that. The, but yeah, but can I move on to the, the, the cautionary part of my thing? Uh, you're going to be discussing the lazy point lease agreement later, and I would just caution you that back in '88 or '89, when we revamped the, the lease agreement, we had probably six or seven public meetings so that people could come in and speak their piece, and I would just caution you against. Moving in haste because this is a 35 year lease you're discussing, and that, that's a generation. You know, it's, it, you know, we'll probably all be dead by the time that lease is expired. Well, most of us will be dead. I don't know all. I don't know. I'm going to stay pretty optimistic. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, really, eat healthy, uh, but Will uh, Gibbons ate healthy, and it didn't do him a lot of good. But, and I, I would just caution you not to act in haste, not to rush to a decision, not to. Well, Dave, to put to try and alleviate some of that, this this was brought up roughly six months ago mm -hmm. to the board that these discussions were going on. Okay, we have been discussing this for roughly two months now. Okay, in the public's eye, with the public's input. Okay, so I wouldn't describe this as being hasty. Well, the draft was just finalized yesterday or a day before yesterday. <laughs> Is that correct? I mean, I just got a new draft. And the public hasn't had the proposal. The for two I, I haven't the public, had a chance to look at it. got the first up. draft. I just got it yesterday, yeah. on Easter. Well, the end of I February. Think, I think uh, Chris um, included well, some changes based on the comments that yeah. were received. Am yeah. I correct? Yeah. So the final and draft. Just, was just, just for the record, this this, this issue, the issue of extending the lease came up um, during the last um, lazy point lease discussion. Um, it was like five years ago when the previous board had um, proposed quadrupling the rents, ensued, ensued five or six meetings. At those meetings, the question of increasing the length of the lease was vigorously discussed. So this is not a new issue for the board. No, I didn't actually think it was a new issue. I just, I, I think though that one of the concerns I have is you're referring to it as the final draft. And you know, until you vote on it and agree with it, it's, it's not the final draft. I mean, we, we must have gone through probably eight or 10 drafts the last time we, when we revamped that, that lease. And we, like I said, we had at least seven or eight meetings and had people come in and comment. And you know, that was back before Tommy Noble, and he was, wasn't even involved in politics at that time. He was one of the, the lazy point people, and he was actively involved in, in that process. But I guess I'm just cautioning against acting in haste and, and, and limit, restricting yourself to a 35-year lease. Like I say, it's a generation. You'll, you know, you'll be sticking how many boards of trustees with that lease? And I, from what I understood the last time, it was explained that if the leaseholder sells their property, the lease started again at thir for, for 35 years. So I, I don't get that sense from reading the document. And I also, I, I don't think that's a great idea to begin with, but I, maybe that's not your intent. Uh, and I, I don't think I would have that as an intent to start the clock from square one because that means if you sign a lease for 35 years and in 2054 in March somebody sells their property to their son or something, now you're looking at a 70-year lease. 
and you know, just moving on and on, and it's just, it's out of your control, and there, there's some language in there that just concerns me about the uh, leaseholder hold, mortgagee, and it seems like you're giving a little bit of the control to the banks, and I would just like some of that language cleaned up a little. I, I don't know, I just think there's more work to be done on it, and I just wanted to caution you against acting in haste, and okay. I know you don't think it's haste, but two months is still, haste when you're looking at 35 years down the road for the lease. But, all right, well, that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, you are aware that right now they are guaranteed a renewal on their annual leases. Yeah, I don't have So a that's in that. perpetuity yeah, at no, this I mean, point. So we're actually putting a limit on it. Yeah, no, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just a concern, though, um, like I say, about that last time it was explained that well, like I said, that if, if you sold the property, that, that the lease counter started all over from 35 years. And, you know, that, that's taken a lot of control out of your hands right there, or out of future board's hands. And I have that down as a topic I'd like to discuss with the trustees tonight. I understand where Dave's coming from, and I actually agree with him uh, to that point. When we get to the Lazy Point leases, let's, uh, I think we should have a meaningful discussion regarding that point, because mm -hmm. I, don't, I do not think the intent was to allow, uh, like he mentions, the tenants to, every time they assign a lease, go ahead and start a new 35-year term. So I think we should have a meaningful discussion about that. Yeah. Well, like I said, I didn't get that intent from the meeting of the lease, and that was just mentioned at that last meeting, and I, I didn't think it was probably all that good of an idea. But. Thank you. Okay, Rod Richardson. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Rod Richardson. Um, I'm representing myself here. Uh, thank you very much for having uh, these meetings open to public comment this way so people can uh, talk about issues that concern me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I um, have multiple emails uh, from the trustee's office uh, assuring me that uh, I would be informed before the Steve Warner report was released here at this meeting. Who sent you those emails? Your office. Who in my office? Arlene. Okay. Uh, I didn't know Arlene was in charge. Right. And, and there, there, I know that there are several trustees here who knew that I, uh, you know, I think Rick knew and some others knew that I had asked to be informed about this. Uh, and I said very explicitly, you know, I'm the guy who raise this issue of the Cartwright Island with you because I'm the guy who was arrested for trespassing on what I assumed was a public foreshore under the public trust doctrine. And I asked you, you know, because your authority rests upon the public trust doctrine, uh, the, because the Donegan patent, you made you pub trustees of the public trust, I asked you to look into it to defend the public trust, to defend public access rights in this town. Um, you know, so when Steve released his preliminary report and I saw it, and I saw that it seemed to be deeply flawed, I asked you not to release it to the public and to inform me when he brought in his report and to, you know, give a, uh, me a chance to, to uh, look at it and maybe have some other experts in actually public trust law uh, and uh, other issues related to that look at it. Uh, because your trustees of the public trust. You don't want to release anything to the public that damages their public access rights, that damages the public trust doctrine. You know, you don't want to do something that precipitous. So even having this meeting where Steve comes and talks, where I'm not noticed, where no expert is given a chance to review the report, where you're going to have stories in the paper that says, Report says, you know, the Gardner's, you know, Cartwright Island is public and, you know, or, or private and nobody can walk there. You know, is, uh, you know, that's highly prejudicial. You know, it, it misinforms the public potentially if that report is wrong. And it's also extremely prejudicial to the case that I have ongoing. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm disappointed that nobody informed me before this meeting. And I only was informed at the very last minute by somebody who texted me and said, hey, Steve Warner is on the agenda. Get over here. So I came over here. And none of the experts who could have weighed in on this are here to do so. 
uh, you know, so the, the, the story that will come out in the newspaper is going to be slanted without their input or without their comment. Okay, so what, what's gone on here is, is prejudicial and against public access rights. I'd like to ask you to not release this report to the public for right now because of that. It's prejudicial to my case. Steve's not a lawyer. The arguments that he presented seem highly controversial to say the least. You know, so I'd also like you to allow me to review it privately, confidentially. I won't release it to the public or to the paper. I won't write about it in the paper. Uh, let's have a, you know, there are, there's a committee of, uh, of four experts that I have uh, assembled who are ready to look at this report when it's ready to be released, who are experts. <coughs> Can I ask you one question? If you had these experts, why weren't you doing your own independent study? Um, why are you depending we, on the public to do it for you? Why are we depending? Why are you depending on the public to do it for you? Well, <clears throat> we're spending public money to try to defend you in court, is what you're saying. But that was never the intent. Yeah, excuse me, but the intent num was number never one, I didn't ask you to go, I did not ask you to go hire Steve to do this. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I asked you to look into it, but I didn't right. ask you to hire Steve to do it. Okay. When Steve released his public report, <coughs> I said, I, I came to you guys, and I said, and, you know, Steve's report seems to be flawed and going off in a direction that is, you know, where he's making these strange arguments. Uh, you know, that, you know, I mean, essentially, if, if you listen to his argument tonight, what he was saying, which is odd, is that, a deed or a royal grant includes things that are not actually mentioned in the grant. He said specifically that Ram Island, Cartwright Island, the Shoals, the Foreshore is not mentioned in the royal grants. He said that. And that's the truth. It's not mentioned. So therefore, maybe the deed to your property includes New Jersey, right? Because it's not mentioned in your grant, and therefore under that theory, you know, something that's not mentioned in your deed is included in your property. That's nonsense. That's not the way deeds work. You know, he mentioned, you know, this, this idea that somehow the public trust doctrine doesn't apply everywhere in New York. That's nonsense. It absolutely does. You know, uh, Bill, I think it is? Yeah. You know, you mentioned the, the, the idea that the king can't grant certain lands. You're close. Actually, what it says is that there's a, there's a case the People versus Staten Island Ferry Company, which says that the king can't give away the right to surface waters. He can't abridge the navigation rights. He can give the bottom land, but he can't give away the right to navigation. So even if Steve is right that the king had the right to give away the, the foreshore, he didn't give away the right to navigate across it you know, because it's intertidal land. So the public still has the right to, to cross yeah. these by that. So that, you know, so there are a lot of statements in that report that strike me as completely wappajawed. So <clears throat> to answer your question, I, I, did ask, I did ask the trustees to have a, you know, to at no cost to the trustees, uh, have this be reviewed by a committee of independent experts before it re is released. And that offer still stands. There are some very good people who appear in front of you, you know, all the time. Kevin McAllister, uh, John Courtney, uh, you know, and, and a, a couple of others, uh, you know, uh, who would be willing to take a look at this. No charge to the trustees. I'm not paying them. They're, you know, they're not beholden to me or anybody. They're, they, you know, they've just, they're knowledgeable about these issues. Before you release it to the public, be darn sure that it's accurate, and if people have differences of opinion, air those differences of opinion on it. Because, you know, you don't want to be the trustees who damage the public trust and public navigation rights by releasing a report that's going to be severely criticized, uh, you know, by experts. So make sure that, you know, so that's my request to you for now. Don't release it to the public. Please do release it to me confidentially, since I'm the guy who asked you know for you guys to look into this. I will only circulate it to some experts uh, in this area, and we will all get back to you uh, with our comments confidentially for you, and then you can decide what to do. 
I, I got to tell you, I really missed the beginning part. You want us to take the report, keep it among ourselves, but you're part of that inner circle. I'm the guy who asked you to look okay, at this question. Okay, but I got to tell you, you're out of your mind if you think I'm going to go along with something like that. Okay, if a report's been prepared by anybody for this board, it is not exclusive to this board. We represent the public. The public will have access to it at or about the same time we do. I don't know how the rest of the people on this board feel, but I could not go along with anything even remote to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am not your attorney. I don't represent you. I represent all of the people in this community. Okay, and there is no kind of like a, like citizen trustee um, thing that you would have have with an attorney here. I, client privilege. Client privilege. I couldn't think of the words. Well, I'm not suggesting that there is, but I don't think you want to release a report that's been put together by one guy who's not an attorney that's making all kinds of legal arguments. That, you know, but you know what, but, but, but Rod, that's a position paper. That's all that is. It's a position paper that he prepared based on the research that he did and the conclusions that he came to. Anybody else is more than welcome to hire an, an additional expert to research the same to the research the same subject matter and come up with a contrary decision or, or, or agree with it, okay? But it's, it's, we're not gonna hold this in secret. It'll get published yeah. and, uh, and, yeah. it's, and it's an individual, a professional individual's well, opinion on, uh, on the ownership of the island. Yeah. This, in, in, in my judgment, any trustee that releases this report as it is without running it by some experts first because it might be prejudicial to public access rights and the public trust is potentially undermining their trust responsibility. Their responsibility to defend the public trust. You're trustees of the public trust. You need to defend it. Taking this action of releasing a report that says that people don't have public access rights and don't have the public trust doctrine doesn't apply is I think an extremely damaging and dangerous thing to do yeah. for you. But that's not what this report so, is well, saying. This, this is a historic report. Wait, this, it's this a historic document. reference to a term. private memorial island, mm -hmm. not to East Hampton Township. Yes, but you know, you're you're basically limiting the public. You know, this report seeks to limit the public access rights to, yeah. for sure. This, it doesn't. Not at all. This, this a, a report is not a, It the presents report, an opinion. That's all it does. Okay. The report's not a trustee document. It's not. It's not a report that was prepared by the trustees. It's not a report that's been put out as this is the gospel by the trustees. We requested an opinion. And we got the opinion. We are wide open to anybody else's opinion on this subject. I don't think it's a settled subject. And uh, it's not done. But well, we, but yeah. but we cannot just and and decide. It would be get your, to, get to your experts to together. And it seems Come up to, with your report. Yeah. Submit it to us, and we'll read it just like we wrote mm -hmm. Steve Borner's report and mm -hmm. consider it as it as as his. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what decision we're really. We're not. We're, we're not really here decision. to make a decision because. We, we, <coughs> right. There's there's really no decision to make here. It was it was under your uh, request. But I'd still like to see a report sure. from your experts. I mean, I, I, I'd be interested to see something. Hmm. That would be something in addition to what we got from Steve. Well, I would need a copy of the report in order to do that. Seems to Can we not give him a copy of the report? It, it yeah, but he's, he's not going to be, he's he's not gonna be the to only one to get it. No, right, no, no. The public, the public it can have it. Then the same access when it becomes Absolutely. a public Absolutely. document. We, we commissioned All this it, is is a document of, document of Steve Borner's archival um, career. Well, he has looked at this information. This is what he's determined. And anybody else who has something else well, to add to this report that differs is welcome as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we did it. Uh, Rod, our, you're we did beyond what we were asked to do by hiring someone who is an expert in, in his field. And this is his opinion. So I, I the door is open to anybody else. And I would love to see someone from 
for, that you have as an expert come in with another report. Rod, your report would be not, not to uh, compete with Steve's. Uh, is, isn't your report, wouldn't your report be an individual report on the findings of your experts? Well, it, or, it, it, or are it, you it, looking for a copy of Steve's report so that you can take his report and use your experts to discredit the report? I mean, I prefer to see a report from your experts mm -hmm. uh, of their own information rather than taking Steve's report and saying, well, in reference to what well, Steve said here, we'd like to say this. Look, you know, I, I expect that the, I mean, the folks that, that I have, uh, you know, or, or, you know, have been uh, expressed a willingness to do this, you know, they have their own interests in these issues. You know, for instance, Kevin McAllister, Defend H2O, has strong interests in what happens out there in the base. Uh, so they may wish to address things that are said in Steve's report, and I wouldn't stop them from doing that. I have, I, I, you know, I would encourage them to do their own analysis of the issue, and then perhaps if they wish to do a commentary on Steve's report. Right, right. But, you know, look, all, I, all I'm, you know, if you guys are bound and determined to release this to the public, I think that you should do so with a note saying that, you know, there are people who have taken strong objection to it, just hearing about what he said, and that you know the 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 issues are therefore controversial, and you're looking for more public input on this. And I wouldn't and even say that. I would just have one little disclaimer that said this is not the trustees' report. We hire an outside counsel or party to review and write a report. This is not uh, the opinions or thoughts of the trustees. One sentence, and, and that's really all there is to it. I think mm -hmm. you guys have already came to the conclusion, hit the nail on the head. The trustees are not in a place where they're going to withhold a public report because one member of the public disagrees with it. You should not and cannot do that. So you guys should just decide amongst yourselves whether, when to release it. If you want to meet and discuss it first, you're more than welcome to. You don't have to, but you guys should just make a decision on when and how you'd like to release it to the public. And that would include Mr. Richardson at that time. That's really just the end of it. I think to the issue of full transparency, it has to be released to the public. I mean, that is full transparency. Everyone in this room expects that. Everything that happens in this room is open to the public. It's on television for everyone to see. And it's a historian's report. What he has discovered, what he feels is, yeah. is I th I information. Think it, I think it should already be considered a public document. Yeah. Just well, I, I, I would like everybody to get a chance to read it and, mm -hmm. and see if they're prepared to accept it as written. And that's it. Well, it is well, his opinion based on the facts that he's Well, discovered. I mean, is it what we paid him for? That's, what, that's really what we're asking right. for. Is that a billing, we, do is we, that a billing question? Or no, is that no. A, do we feel it's content. A com the content is complete for what we were asking? I mean, he already, we, it already went back once yeah. because we, he, he did not yeah. include. And then what happens things? to this? It's just report. It's, it's just it gets like, filed and it's like so many other things that we've had that we paid somebody to prepare. It's available to the public if they okay. see if they see a use for it. Right. They're like, welcome to use. It's like Chris it. Gobler's report. Yeah, yes. Chris Gobler's report. Cy Consilla's report. Sure. Yeah. Uh, can I, would I be wrong to consider it in a public document right now? I don't see why not. Right. It's, it's not, not like it's not it was not presented like, not like at a public meeting. It's a public document. <laughs> I would, uh, I would make it available at the trustee office in a hard copy and on the website, just like we always do after, uh, after a meeting. Okay. Fair enough. So do we, are we voting on this issue? I don't or think we there's a vote. I think it needs a vote. There's nothing to vote on it. Well, are you going to at least review the report before you re release it? I think you should at least do that. I reviewed it. I've already reviewed I it as well. It. I read it. I read it. I read the first. I read it. I read it. I read the okay. changes. Well, I'm comfortable with it. I've read it. I'm not, you know. Again, it's I someone that we hired to do it. the research, and this is oh, what okay. he's come up with. But, and but this again, is what he's determined. everybody should understand this. The document is what it says it is. It's a report that was prepared for this board by somebody else. It's not our report. It's not a report we necessarily agree with. We'd be more than happy to get a report from anybody that's interested in. Uh, speaking on the subject, and mm -hmm. perhaps after we sort it all out, we might come to an opinion or we might not. But right now, 
It's a report that we paid for. I, I believe it's become a public document. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> mm -hmm. all right. Well, I, you can get I a copy of it in the morning if you want. Yeah, all right. It's on yeah. television. Yeah. Well, I'll be away starting tonight for a week, so I won't be able to pick it up, but I'll pick it up uh, next week. Um, I will do my best to uh, uh, give you a report from other experts who are, some of them will be lawyers and some of them will be otherwise uh, ecological experts, et cetera, on the subject. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Okay, next up, Elaine Jones. I believe when the report is made public as tonight, it can be foiled. Anybody can foil for a copy. Um, I turned in Friday. I didn't realize on Friday that the trustees were only open until 1230. So there is a petition being. By the way, Elaine. Elaine Jones. Yes, I know. Um, I, Arlene and I were both there until 1.15. Uh, I, was I, I didn't there. see you there at 12. I was there knocking on the door, Francis, uh, and Arlene told me to come down at 12 o'clock in a half hour. If right. I came and, down, and, and, now you're really and not waiting telling for you. Me the and truth. waiting for you, we stayed until 1:15. So let's move on. There was a copy of boy, oh boy, oh boy, what you won't do. Arlene <laughs> told me to come down at 12:30. I went. I knocked on the door. I was there in a half hour. It was 12.30, and I, 12.35, actually, okay. if you really want to know. I knocked on the door, and there was a note on the door that said, all email, all whatever d pertaining to Lazy Point had to be scanned or emailed at a mm -hmm. certain time. So I went to Rona's, and I asked her would she scan understand. and, and email you got, the you, petitions You got your petition me. in Tell on time. about the petitions. I know, and you got it in on time. I just want to say that uh, but you I got an there, email. You, and if you were inside, you weren't answering the door, Francis. Well, well oh, I was please. right there in the front office. Uh, well, you didn't answer the door, so uh -huh. I can say. And Arlene called and apologized to me because she was told to go home. OK. Um, Is that Arlene So the you? petitions are circulating. God, the and things you I make didn't up, have time. The things you make up amaze me. No, no, the things you <laughs> lie about amaze me, Francis. Okay. You have no idea, yeah, yeah, Francis. Yeah. Yep. Keep talking. Just yep. keep talking. No, I'll let you uh, the We, the undersigned, as residents of East Hampton Town, oppose the, oppose the East Hampton Town trustees changing the one-year <clears throat> lease of Lazy Point to a 35-year lease. We do, however, support a shorter-term shorter lease of perhaps five or ten years. And this is being circulated. I didn't have time to pick all of them up from all the people. So I figured, I don't think you're going to vote tonight because I really think you've made changes in the lease, correct? And I'm told if you've made changes, you really can't you have to have another draft. I only got the draft yesterday. Now, and not to bring politics into this situation of lazy point leases, but in June, there is going to be a primary, and it is very possible that some of the members on this board may be in the November election. And you are leaving the newer trustees in the future trying to solve this. Um, I can't believe that you are giving away lazy point leases for 35 years, and the property doesn't belong to you to give away. It belongs to the East Hampton Town hey, residents. Can we just correct that, Elaine? Uh, I'm we not, are, I we are, first of we all, let me speak, Mr. <laughs> Grimes. Let me finish, and then I'll ask you a question. OK. OK. This is a huge giveaway, and there are uh, the petitions are being circulated. And I think the public has a right to decide. I, I believe there should be a referendum, actually. I, like I said, the people support a five or 10 year lease for Lazy Point, but they don't support a 35 year lease. Um, that's all I really have to say. But I do, I had an interesting, when Sarah Davidson gave her performance there before, she talked about Phragmites. She wasn't performing. Ms. Kieber, do you know what the DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation laws are on Phragmites? Yes. Okay. I'm mm -hmm. familiar with Phragmites. As okay. I expressed to you, I do a lot of work with land. Okay, but do you know the DEC laws? 
I'm asking I'm you. I'm fairly familiar with them, and I'm, why are you asking me that? Well, I'm asking you a question because she. Because I pay attention up. to everything that Sarah um, presents to us. She brought up the pragmites and the cutting, and I'm asking you, do you know the Department of Environmental and Conservation laws on pragmites? There are differences of opinions, and yes, I am familiar with. So the, what are they? Could you explain them? We 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 approve permits based on our. Okay. Views. Maybe Mr. Not, Grimes. Not, not on DEC. Jim, you are in the business. You know about Phragmites. Maybe I know you about Phragmites. I'm really trying to get my head around what it has to do with Lazy Point. It doesn't. But I just said no. Well, I'll be glad to it answer the question. Nothing. It has nothing okay. to do the with Lazy Point. Okay. I listened to okay. the DEC. Okay. The Phragmites, by the nature of its natural habitat in wetland areas, which are DEC regulated areas, are regulated, the activities pertaining to Phragmites are regulated just the same <coughs> as any activity within a wetland area. They're an invasive species. Correct? Well, excuse me. Can Go ahead. I, now you can, can I talk. finish now? Oh, sure. Okay. She's in charge. Phragmites, as a, as a species, there are fer several different subspecies or clones of that plant. Phragmites is a native plant throughout the same latitudes around the world. What happened here? We've had Phragmites here going all the way back to when this place was settled and before that. Something happened in the 1930s where all of a sudden Phragmites went from being this sort of benign plant to being much more aggressive. It has been determined pretty decisively that the Phragmites clone that we see here today was an introduced clone, perhaps from Asia somewhere. Mm -hmm. But in either case, it's very aggressive, it displaces a lot of the native plant material, and the DEC is open to proposals for either the cutting or removal of Phragmites. It does not mean you're going to allowed to just do it. You have to get a DEC permit, you have to get in the town of East Hampton, a natural resources special permit. Okay, you have to get on trustee bottom lands. You have to get a trustee permit. You also have to apply for Army Corps permits, depending on where these things are, or Department of State permits. Okay, did I answer your question, no, you Elaine? Didn't. How many times a year can Phragmites be cut? What is the law? I asked for the law. D that's not a law. That's not a law. That's the wrong question. It's, it's, do you have a specific permit that you're you speaking to? You have to apply to? for a permit, but how many times a year can you cut? I'm told that you can cut twice a year in July and whatever. That's Actually, it depends. It's not a law, Elaine. The DEC doesn't tell you that? The, I was DEC, told by the DEC, when they issue a permit, will, it will include specific language to what you're allowed to do during that that period. I was told that the DEC only allows twice a year in East Hampton Town. It's recommended. It's recommended twice, twice a, year. a year. And there's okay. recommended height. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I, I would assume you're not voting on Lazy Point tonight. I would not stick around. I don't assume anything. <laughs> well, if you do, if you do, there will be so many lawsuits against the town of East Hampton because of this. But you do what you want. Thank, Thank you. you. Point, of, point of information. Yes. Vince, if you could come up to the podium, I'm sorry. I'm going to My name is Vincent Priori. I'm a resident at Lazy Point. As just a point of information, I thought public comment on the 35-year leases ended this past Friday. Yeah. You're right. Am I correct? Or not? Correct. That's correct. So I didn't sign the public comment sheet because I thought any comment I would make in regards to the 35-year leases would not be allowed. Now I hear everybody yeah. coming up here talking well, about the you can speak. At least you can speak as a public if, comment. If that's the about case, I can speak anything I want as a public comment. I and the well, trustees do not need to take that into consideration. Doesn't yeah. enter into right. the record. It's, it's I would recommend that record. her petition that she submitted on time on Friday was entered. Any of her comments do not need to be uh, taken into consideration. That's fine. That's fine. Well, the same goes for Mr. Priori. May, may I then ask if at the end of the comment period here, if there are more comments in regards to the Lazy Point 35-year lease, that I'd be allowed an opportunity to at least talk about that? You certainly would. Thank you very much. Okay. Ben, you might want to stay, stay up there. There's nobody else on the list. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak? 
Okay. Anyone else in the audience? Would okay. you like to speak? Yeah. Um, I really wasn't prepared to speak tonight. I mm -hmm. thought the comment period would be closed, so I hope we can be a little concise here. If I ramble a little bit, please excuse me. I'm not too sure I understand what the objections are for a 35-year lease. The trustees aren't breaking new ground with a 35-year lease. The town of East Hampton has a 99-year mm -hmm. lease. The town of Babylon Excuse me. has... Can, can you please keep quiet? I can shake my head for you. No, you're, you're just speaking. Oh, you're speaking. just speaking. I was speaking to Ron. Yeah, well, I can hear you. I'm trying to hear well, him. God, I wish I could tell you how I, how I hear you. <laughs> Elaine, I was quiet when you spoke. All right, I appreciate you keep the same, talking. same consideration. Anyway, the town of Babylon has a lease program on 400 residents in the Barrier Islands. 400. <clears throat> Those leases originally started at 35 years, six years ago. The town of Babylon voluntarily, voluntarily said, let's extend the leases to 50 years. Tony, or Tony Schaefer, I believe, who is the town supervisor of the town of Babylon, at that time said, we're extending the to leases to 50 years because this is a win-win for the town. Rick Schaefer. Rick Schaefer, I'm yep. sorry. That's all right. Thank you very much. You're Rick welcome. Schaefer. Said this is a win-win for the town. All we hear over here are negative comments in regards to 35-year leases. It's an election. What is the Lazy Point community looking to achieve here? We're looking for a level of security. Mm -hmm. What's so wrong with that? I don't understand the dialogue that comes out of here about, oh my god, you can't do this, you can't do that. What about this problem? What about that problem? I mean, I've heard problems about, oh my god, if somebody gets a mortgage and somebody defaults on the mortgage, Let's put that in perspective. The default rate in the United States on mortgages right now is 1%. In the Great Recession, the last recession we had, it was under 5%. Put that in another perspective. There are 50 homes in Lazy Point. Those homes would have to be mortgaged twice to achieve the national percentage of 1%. So we're making a big deal out of a potential maybe of a mortgage default. It doesn't really, it's not an issue. It really is a non-issue. Why we talk about this, I don't know. I mean, we come around and we say, oh, you grant them a 35-year lease, they're going to have McMansions. Well, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist here to drive down Shore Road in Lazy Point and say you've got a a whole bunch of pieces of property that are about an eighth of an acre. How do you put a McMansion on an eighth of an acre? It's impossible. Yet there's a big headline saying, oh, this is what's going to happen. There's so much innuendo and false information that's being put out over here about the Lazy Point community is absolutely ridiculous. We come here week after week, meeting after meeting, to sort of say, hey, guys, you recognize what this situation is. You want to establish or continue the relationship that has been built up between the Lazy Point community and the trustees. We're asking for a 35-year mortgage. Oh, I, I mean, a 35-year lease. I, the people here, for the most part, seem to agree with that, except you get some dissenters that constantly speak up about this. For whatever reason, I don't know. I don't know what they have against the Lazy Point community that makes them so afraid that granting a 35-year lease to a Lazy Point resident is going to break the mold. 35-year leases are not breaking the mold. Do you realize that's an entry-level position for anyone that would like to develop any sort of equity in their home if they want to fix a roof and get a loan or whatever. You can't do that with a five or ten year mortgage. Mm -hmm. You need lease. 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 I'm sorry. Lease. <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry. Sorry. Well, anyway. Or anyway. Yeah. I get a little emotional here because it gets to be <laughs> absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. <understand>. Um, <laughs> we have a 
you know, Mr. Grimes, Jim said at one of the last meetings that you really try to establish a relationship between tenant and landlord. And I think he's been on both sides of the fence. I've been on both sides of the fence. That relationship is critical for any sort of arrangement where you have a landlord and a tenant to really succeed. You have to have trust. I think the board here is trying to say, hey, we want to continue the trust that has been developed over the last three or four years. I mean, Diane McNally got up here and said, oh, you know, there was a lot of dissension. Well, she's right. There was a lot of dissension, and it was on her watch that that dissension happened. I think it's time we put an end to this whole situation. We're asking for security. It's a 35-year lease. This is not rocket science. It really isn't rocket science. Could there be some potential problem downstream with this? Yes, maybe there could be. But that's why we have elected officials, so they deal with problems. Anyway, listen, I really appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll give you, I have one thing to say. I'll give you one time and okay. one time only. Okay. First of all, first of all, the town of Brookhaven, Babylon, and all the other places he's talking about don't have an East Hampton town trustee board or a Donegan patent. That's number one. Dongan. Dongan. Okay, I always say it wrong, Francis. I know. But I will tell you this, don't you think? Well, Brookhaven that, does. Brookhaven has town trustees. No, I'm only told. No, no, no. Brian? Uh, only, just a little something. No, no. Only, I, you, Brian, I, I, oh, you oh, only oh, give oh, me five oh, minutes. Oh, 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 Brian, please, please. only Southampton Town Brookhaven and has a Donkin patent. They do have the Donkin patent. Of course they, they do. I've never heard that. Only Southampton no, and No, no, Brookhaven has one. Okay. Um, Let's forget that. But don't you think... <laughs> I never heard. Where did you find that? They don't have. They don't have. They don't have trustees. You're right. They do not have. Not any more. They do have a Duncan patent. Brian, they may have a Duncan patent. But they don't have an elected board of trustees. Correct. Okay, I'm correct. I know I'm correct. No, no, we're correct. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Why? And you won't be here in January. You're gone, Brian. So you oh, definitely won't be on the board. Oh, no. I will tell you this. It's chilly all of a sudden in here. Oh, Brian, you <laughs> always, you know, you always make it chilly when you talk about other people. And I resent the fact oh, that goodness. you said at this board that I'm a mean person. You are. I cooked. <laughs> no, you said at this board to somebody, I'm a mean person. Oh. Oh. But I have, oh yes, Brian, you did. Am I the same person Brian. who went camping with your grandchildren? And Brian, and entered your home? did I not cook for your wife when she had cancer, Brian? And did I you never not? had cancer. And she called me oh. mom. Oh, Brian. Maybe that was my mistress. This is okay. Yeah. Let's stop the argument. You okay, you got it. Anyway, there are no trustees but Southampton and East Hampton. But. There are Can't some trustees wait? in Southampton. Now, yes, Hampton. there are trustees yeah. in Southampton and East Ham. But can we not wait to see what the public thinks with the petition? Can we not wait? Do you have to vote tonight? Elaine, Elaine, Elaine. Can we not wait? Jimmy? I'm just asking you a question. Can we not wait until you see how many signatures you get from the people of the town of East Hampton? Because they are being circulated. Yes, and but they why are, are they not here speaking for themselves? Because, Francis, first of all, I didn't have time. It only started on the but, 13th. But this is you making no, an effort to block this. I'm not. If they were really oh, interested, if they were truly why interested, don't you they wait? would be here speaking. Why don't you? First of all, they're signing petitions. They right, don't have time. Right, because you're people making have, the effort. I'm not making the effort. Yes, you are. Francis, they're all over town. Other people have them. Do you not give people? Lucy Bennett. Lucy Bennett signed that petition that I turned into yes, you, and she, she owns a house on mm -hmm. Lazy Point. So, and she, I told her I'd never mention her name, and she told me to mention her name. It's fine. Just give it a time. You don't need to vote for something until you find out how the people of this town feel. But only and we have a right to. Ca in fact, I think there should be a referendum. But you do what you want the because you'll be the facing the public. Do, the trustees don't do referendums. Do whatever the hell you want. 
Okay. Chris, is that a can, yes? Can we address the referendum issue? Is that possible? No. Do you, do you believe no, it's required? We, no, it's not required. No. Public referendum is not required for this type of transaction. Our attorney believes there's no referendum required for this type of transaction. But we can force a referendum. We can do a referendum. We Go can't for it. I Go on it. But there are petitions. I would think this board would think carefully and let the people of this town know. <laughs> this, this isn't Because right. they didn't know. Only two months, Francis. But, Elaine. This has been a and, long time. And, and your we petition went out last week. We, had to, we didn't know that this was going on. It started in January. Oh, Elaine, please. Francis, <laughs> But you will pay for the repercussions. Okay. Elaine, okay. Elaine, okay. we had I'll, our I'll meeting take that on the eighth. Because I, I'm, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to play the, the politic game like East you do. Okay. I'm here to help people. The residents of enough. East Stampton Town own that property. Okay. We're done. Do we want to uh, We're done. Right. do something okay. with this tonight? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, does somebody want to make a motion? What to about the hands in the audience? Is there anybody else here? Absolutely. You want to speak? Sure. Come on up. Come yeah, on up. Come please. up. Hello, my name is Kathy Vatter, and I own a, a well, place in Lavery Point. Thank you for that. Is there any reason, just for the heck of it, that we couldn't just have a hand? You know, just a vote fast to show the people in favor? Because we seem to have so many people dissenting, or that's not allowable? No, we're the ones who are going to be voting. The, well, no, I mean, just the people in favor would be the Well, it's, it's, it's kind of a nice <coughs> gesture, but I, I, I really no, think, I think looking out at the audience here. You have the hand. hand I think right. I got a fairly good idea where everybody's <laughs> sitting <laughs> right now, okay? In fact. You don't on the petition. So. But, how, but Cop, Elaine, please. could you please answer, how many names do you have? You handed in a petition with 17 names on it. We started on the 13th. But why did you wait? Five days but why did you wait days. that long? Why did you wait? Why did you wait? Why did you wait? Guys, the, yeah, the public comment period closed on Friday, so yeah. any, any petitions after that can be dismissed. Could you please state your name? Sir. Sure. we all know you. Keith McMahon. Enough, Elaine. Keith. Hello, Keith. All right. Hello, Keith. I want to thank you folks for dealing with what you're dealing with. <laughs> okay, one more time. Is there anybody else in the audience who has, would like to speak? Okay, we're moving on. Well, Francis, I'd like to speak quick. On the, uh, on the specific language in the lease that Dave Talmadge spoke to before. I think he made a great point. I do have some updated language here to clarify that point. If there's any questions about it, I'm happy to speak with you guys about that. But in effect, the language is not going to allow a tenant upon assignment to enter into a new 35-year lease. What's going to happen is they would assume the remainder of the time period of that lease. And from a practical standpoint, what would happen is perhaps five to 10 years down the road when there's future boards here, and maybe we're underneath that 30-year threshold that's required to get a 30-year mortgage. You're going to have some of these tenants approach you and say, hey, will you guys take another look at this? We're now in year 25, whatever it may be. And there's going to be opportunity for future board members to take a look at this 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And just like Brookhaven or Babylon did, agree to another 35 years. But I think it's important that we keep it on that same time frame. That, that way we're not chasing down leases at different time, time frames. So that's what the language says, and that's what it's going to say. I'd be happy to talk to you. Guys. Yeah, Jim. OK. Along those lines, um, could, we, could we then, so to, to, to kind of alleviate some of the, some of the members of the public that are, that are reticent about this, could we set this up a little like you have an adjustable mortgage where every five years um, there is a dialogue and an opportunity? Like, let's say the, you know, we've got 2% escalators in this lease right now. But let's say there's an economic downturn or, or a runaway inflationary situation where the dollar changes and the, uh, there might be reasons on both, both, for both parties to adjust some of the conditions of the lease. Would the Lazy Point community um, support something like that in this lease that gives both parties the opportunity 
to come to the table and uh, adjust things. I'd love to hear something. No. Okay. But would the banks agree to that if they were to have a mortgage? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it seems like once a lease is signed, it's... Well, no, no, but, but can I tell you what commercial leases commonly have, like, five-year reviews on them. Uh, that's not an uncommon thing. On a commercial lease, it's not an uncommon thing. I don't know that it's necessary, Jim. Okay. I think that from a practicality standpoint, again, you know, this is going to be in the rules. So the future board's going to have the opportunity to look at this. They can change the rules All and right. say, you know, we this can decide amongst ourselves whether we want to amend, a lot, you know, mutually, can be mutual parties would have to sign it to extend the term for another 35 years, whatever that okay. may be. So it's sort of a moot point. All right, that said, I'd like to make a motion. Do you have any questions? I just wanted to ask one thing. I thought I had read that that lease would only, if a, if a child came to re take over, if someone had passed away, um, that it, they would only receive the remainder of the 35-year lease. Mm -hmm. It was not uh, my understanding that they yes. would start a new 35-year lease. That was not my understanding. That's right. correct. That's what we're clarifying. Right. 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 Okay. We're clarifying. So, yes. It's, it's going to be just a 35-year lease. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the 35-year the lease. Hey, was that purchase wording where it said purchase? Was that changed? That's the, yeah, that's in the fourth whereas of the first page of the lease. Okay. And uh, if you look on the with edits copy, it should be pretty clear that that was, uh, that was removed. Okay. But wouldn't, wouldn't we, with these additional amendments that were just put in over the weekend, and what Chris is referring to now that's going to be added in, you know, any amendment up to a procedural document, any amendment would have to be afforded the you know the tenants the board and the public an opportunity to review well, but before point, anything is, I mean, is the like like hearing. dave said you know they they did six or eight you know procedural hearings with changes and, and, made why and, and susan why wouldn't we do and the susan same and, thing and you know what at the end of their deliberations you know what the tr lazy point community got one year leases but okay the, um, but they also but got one-year leases that are guaranteed to be renewed. Okay, every but year. that's every year. So yeah. they have, they, right now they have an infinite lease. And we're well, cutting they it don't, down to years. If it's not years. in the contract, Bill, Bill, if it's they, not in the Bill, contract, it's Bill, not you can frame that fine. however you want. The reality is a le as a legal document, it's a one-year lease. Okay? No, you can have the guarantee of the renewal, but without... Without extending that lease to a period that gives the tenant some equity in that investment, no. there, it, there, there, it's only a one-year lease. Okay, no, the goal I, here was to, to was to allow this community yeah. to gather some to gather some equity in that investment, and at the same time we maintain the revenue stream, which we very much depend on, and we very much thank the Lazy Point community. <laughs> Jim, Four. Jim, I would like to second your motion. All right. Go to this. Thank you. Uh, we had a motion on the floor for, uh, and I, I think I this I'd just like to speak to Susan's point, which I think was if changes were made, I think what she's saying is shouldn't the public have the way to weigh in. And I'd just like to give, you know, my thought on that. Okay. My, my thought is, and, and I don't know if I'm right about this, we had a public hearing, we heard comment, and the changes were made to reflect those comments. And were the changes the were the changes significant? And did they change the uh, did they change this document in any real real way other than clarifying some points? No. Okay. But under New York State law of, of committee of open meetings, any any amendment to any procedural change has to be, you have to start from the beginning and you have to re-notice it and, and give the opportunity for everyone involved, the board, the public, the individuals, the chance to review and speak on before any vote is taken. That being said, I would defer to our attorney because I honestly don't know the full uh, capacity of your of, of what you're saying you could very well be true Chris right so to Susan's point John sort of tried to clarify that which was 
we had the public hearing, we had the com public comment period. I took all of that information, reviewed all the letters and all of the emails, we input it into this document, and now it's time to, to vote on it, if you agree that you want to vote on it. Okay. it otherwise, it would be a never-ending cycle of every time we have a draft, we have a new public comment period, and a new period, and it would just go on forever, and it's just, a, it's mm. just that, that's sort of the goal of, of somebody that would say otherwise. But that's, that's in the opposite of what the New York State Committee on Open well, Law Procedures is. That's your interpretation, and I'm, I'm, that's why we have And I attorney. just want to be fair to everybody. Absolutely, and that's why we're deferring to our attorney to uh, give us uh, his uh, thoughtful opinion on this. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. We have a second to the motion. Okay. I think given the gravity of this situation, it requires, it should have a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. So, Lori, if you could go through the roll call and record the... John the Rothrich. <coughs> All things considered, I'll vote yes. Susan Forpo. I think at this time I would prefer to abstain. I'm, I'm, I'm still not totally comfortable in the wording of the document and, and securing, being, being secure in the knowledge that we are not hindering future trustee boards the, the public lands, the common lands that we're in trust for, I, I think it's very fair to afford the Lazy Point residences longer leases. I'm not sure that, that in all fairness to them and the trustees and the public, this document is gonna provide that. Um, I know speaking to some professionals in the, in the mortgage business that this to them this document is not cut and dry and every lender that this goes in front of they're going to have their legal team dissect it the lease agreement and the rules and regs mm -hmm. and in order for anybody to obtain a mortgage all parties have to be in agreement so that would mean that these lenders and the leaseholders would have to come back to us to iron out these issues if they were to come up. And I don't know if we're creating more, more of a problem for us and or future boards that we really are intending to do here. Um, and I, I just think that also one point that, that hasn't really been discussed is the whole environmental landscape of Lazy Point and and I think that maybe before we really sign off on something like this in all fairness to the residents and to us maybe we should have a experts come in and 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 look at the environment what is that what is that shoreline going to look like in 10 20 35 years and and do we want to promote people getting tied into these long leases if, if, you know, maybe that landscape might drastically change. Um, as far as the getting loans to upgrade their, their houses and their systems, you know, there's, there's all kinds of rules and regulations on that and the, and the permitting and the, you know, some people will be constrained on making their residents FEMA compliant which there's nothing wrong with that, but in all fairness, that Susan, might how are they, not happen. how are they going to be constrained on that? Because the septic systems require so Actually, much Suffolk land County, and, and, County, and everything is so constrained. Suffolk, Suffolk County Department of Health has adopted a best fit policy Should we be having a on their septic system the upgrades. Oh. No, we're voting, you're okay. right. No. You're uh, I'm recused. Yeah. Uh, I'm in favor. 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 And I will just say this. This is the right thing, in my opinion, to do for the neighbors and our community, for the people who want security. I feel that this is the right thing to do. We all live on an island that is subject to coastal erosion. And we are all here because we choose to live here and take the risk to live here. So I am very much in favor of this. And I said from the beginning, you deserve stability. You deserve to. Um, 
uh, fix your homes if need be, and this is an opportunity an opportunity to procure funding if a bank, if you can get something from a bank to help you. And I'm here to vote yes to help you. I'm going to abstain um, only because I think uh, the Lazy Point community certainly deserves everything they're asking for. However, I'm not 100% certain that the town of East Hampton wants this, the people who own the property that we manage it for. And I just haven't heard enough of them. And I said at the beginning that if they didn't come out and represent themselves or the other side, that I was going to just vote in favor of the people of Lazy Point. Um, they didn't come out. Mm -hmm. uh, they continue to disappoint me for not coming out for, for, for these important issues. But, you know, you folks in Lazy Point are good folks. And you got a really, you got paradise over there. And I want the best for you. And I suspect you're going to get it. Um, I'm just abstaining only because I received the, the finalized draft last night and I'm sure there's not many changes but just in case I'm gonna play it on the safe side folks so just just understand that I'm only abstaining just to play it on the safe side for the entire community but I have no objection to you folks getting what you want and, and getting the security that you need I just think uh, we, we should have taken a little bit more time to make sure that we're doing it the proper way. And if it does turn out that this is the proper way, that's speed. And good luck to you all. God bless you. That's all. Lori, what was the tally on that vote? Um, let's see. Six in favor. Well, actually six in favor, um, two abstained, and one um, recuse. OK, thank you. Okay, motions carry. Motion carry. Hey, guys, one minute before we leave this. Uh, Chris, when do those leases term out, the, the present leases? April 28th. Okay. I would like to make a motion to extend the present leases for a 30-day period to allow um, the administrative the, process. To allow the administrative process, to allow final drafts to be circulated on this thing, to allow the community's councils to review them, and, uh, and, and if need be, we could have to discuss some little fine boilerplate issues. But, uh, I'll second that. Yes, I think that's thank fair. you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Fremont Harbor, application from owner of 60 Hedges Banks Drive, Suffolk County Tax Map 300 35. Can we take wait, a minute? No, wait break? till the room clears. Pictures? <laughs> <laughs> This was before that. I'm going to go over it. I don't want to lose this one. Thank you. Don't lose it. Yep. I'm looking at a bottle of alcohol. I have to have it. Catch it with a cake. with a cake because I am um, one of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. You guys deserve as much as you want to have. Yeah. Let me hear the water. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to be, I'll be there. Thank you. I'll keep my word. Thank you. Thank you. If you were ever running for public order, just folks, you're very kind. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's get back. I'm going to tell you, this kind of bums me out. Why? You get what you ask for, and then everybody leaves. <laughs> Right, no thank you notes? 
Yeah. Chris stayed. Thank you. Great <laughs> TV. Well, you're up next at some point, right? Don't we have uh, Chris yeah, on? Yeah, he's on. All right. He's on our agenda. We have an application from the owner of 60 Hedges Banks Drive, Suffolk County Tax Map 300 35 1 1.17 yeah. for I'm bluff saying? restoration. Okay. Can't read. Yeah. Uh, just meters. Four pictures. Is this, is this it here? That's, yeah. yes. This is, uh, this is that property, September, last September. Mm hmm. Um, this is one shot. There's, this is another shot. This bare slope here is uh, Cedar Point County Park property. And this is the uh, applicant's property. September 2018. This is last week. Same shot by the stairs and the same shot, Cedar Point Park property here, and the owner's property. And that's what he's trying to rectify. It's, I, I'm assuming this was all done by heavy rainfall. Well, heavy rainfall and scouring at the toe. John, the matting that, that you talked about, is that the jute that they plan on putting down? I think it's core matting. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's jute and core yep. are I'm the with. same, yeah. same so material, like a burlap? different. Uh, it's like a it's like a wide weave burlap. It's like a one by one inch space, kind of so it allows the grass to grow through it. Yeah, like what they, is that what they so use? Grass will be prevents the the, 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 the the plants. Runoff, from yeah, grass. prevents the runoff from the top. I mean. Uh, it doesn't yeah. give you a topo on this survey. Is it a case where the, the grade falls off towards the bluff? A lot of those go the other way on some I of those properties. don't know what it is on the landward side. I believe it does. Yeah. Do they have, um, do they have DEC or town permits on this yet? That I'm not sure. I believe they do. I spoke to Billy Mack called me just before the meeting started. And he said they'd like to get going, you know, within a, as soon as they can. So I'm assuming they do. Uh, um, do vehicles? One, one, yeah. one thing yes, on that drawing that you yeah. should take into consideration is that if you notice, they've got the, uh, the new bluff toe coming out basically about 10 feet mm -hmm. from where this toe is. So you yeah. probably come about to the end of the stairs there. It's most the end on the beach, the better. I think eventually that toe will become our beach. So well, the, the deal is, is in order for that sand to hold in place and reach that angle of repose that they're trying to get to, they have to come it's out. Necessary. They have to come out to that That's distance. my feeling. How much yeah. sand is required? 800 <coughs> 800 yards? <coughs> That's a pretty wide beach down there. I mean, it's yeah, not going to get be... wider, too. Yeah. So would sand fencing help down there at the base? Well, I think post-installation of this, the sand fencing will help. But, you know, this is a, a this is a hard area, you know, because a lot of times when you, when you try, when you're establishing, like the beach grass establishes pretty easily on these bluff faces. Mm -hmm. But what happens is they're north facing, so the beach grass is a little slow to emerge in the spring, and it's rather quick to go dormant in the fall. And as you can see, the root system only penetrates maybe 12 inches, so you can get yourself into that situation where whole sheets of the bluff slough off, and it happens after the toe gets eroded. Once you lose the toe, it's not to say that what's going to happen here is not going to happen again. It looks like but mine. I think it does maintain some stability. I'm in favor of doing this kind of work. But uh, it seems to me that a bluff like this might call for terracing. But this, you know what the problem you have here is there's not much you know, you can dry, do the terracing, kind of like they did at the lighthouse years ago, where you're driving stakes or pipes into the ground and stepping it back, like, you know, one increment at a time, like Georgina Reed did years ago. But at the end of the day, the structural integrity 
is the pipes that you drove into the drove into the buff. It's the bluff. depth, the depth into the and, bluff. And you know yeah. your 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 structure lasts as long as your is there your other anchors. is there other uh, vegetative material that would send root is there, deeper into the bluff? Well, this is the dilemma that you find yourself in. You know, sometimes that mixture. You know, if you look like a long. Um, in Amagansett and that, the bluffs in Amagansett, you got that mixture of woody vegetation and some grasses there. The woody vegetation gives you a little bit deeper, yeah. deeper, deeper stability. But this is the situation you get into there. The tree gets to a certain height, the wind starts to blow it back and forth. It destabilizes the bluff and it's a little counterintuitive. You know how you save the bluff? You cut the tree down and you let it sucker up. Right. so that the wind can't play on it, but you still have the benefits of the root system. I think what they're trying to do here is something quick and immediately effective, which honestly is, is the beach grass, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. And Billy said that they would like to get this done as, permitted as quickly as possible so that the beach grass right. has the yeah. optimal We're in growing season now. Do you, want, so. do, you want to a, do you want to put a motion on the floor yeah, then? Yeah, I'll make a motion. Does, does he have so his other permits in place? Well, that's, not sure. Sure. So that's going to be the permit question. Subject to, be subject yeah. to subject yeah. all other permits. I'll second that. What is it subject oh. to? All other Easy. permits being in place. I'm sorry. This, this all other permit. permits okay. being in place. Okay. And who's second? Rick. I did. It, I, okay. this, this is just a minor point, but I, why is our permit going to be subject to their permit? Uh, they're because we don't the want them right, but he's not going to be able to do the work without the other permit. Well, I think we got to make that very clear. Yeah, I don't think it hurts to say it. All right. So that we're, yeah. I think you need to make it clear. I made contingent to yeah, contingent on the other permits. And I, I would, I would not issue this permit physically until they have the unless other you can permits. somebody can show that they've got the other permits in hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, can, can you make a note of that, Lori? What's that? That Arlene shouldn't actually give him the permit okay. physically until he can show that he's got the DEC. And okay. Yeah. Because we made that. I made that mistake myself mm -hmm. once, and it's, I'm not going to do it again. You need a town permit, also, right? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Right. So, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. But subject to DEC and resources. Thank you, John. Okay, um, <clears throat> old business. Uh, we need to discuss Dr. Goble's proposal for 2019, the water quality assessment for mm -hmm. town waters. Um, we got an email today from Dr. Gobler, which I had re I had asked him um, if we might be able to price the units separately for Akabonic Harbor, the North End, because that's been something that we've been discussing. Um, Akabonic Protection Committee is interested in having a northern um, buoy there as well, not just the culvert where we've been testing, and also Pussy's Pond. So um, his email this morning to me was that, uh, I'll just read it, the budget as drafted can perform the microbial source tracking at three locations, hence the locations could be Akabonic Harbor, Pussy's Pond, and one more site. If you're interested um, in repeating the 2018 sites in Three Mile Harbor and adding these two sites, we could add those two sites for eight. Eight thousand. Mm -hmm. Now, how many tests does that actually include? I know I rec I, I understand the number of sites. Think but what's the frequency three, on four, that? Three or I think it's three, three in Three Mile three Harbor. Did, well, they did they did them three times. I think. Mm -hmm. Do you have three or four different dates? Three or four. Let me say. I I personally would not like to see us trade one for the other I'd prefer to see this expand so would I but I just want to be under I just want to be sure I understand um, 
well, what, one, what we're getting protocol. One question I had was there's some take fecal coliforms, for example. I don't know how much it costs within this proposal for the fecal coliform test, but that's the DNA test. No, no that's not different separate. No, no, it's just a baseline. I mean the DEC does fecal coliform tests all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you know, there's like one state, how many, I'm not sure how many stations there are in Akabonic Harbor for people call for. I don't think it's more than three. DC has 20 stations in Akabonic Harbor. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't rewrite this proposal or at this point, the but there could be, you know, so with some discussion with Chris's. Fine tuning. Could, yeah. Well, the DC, and the DC data is available, correct? Yes. Yeah. Could be so, so maybe where we're not overlapping on some of the stuff, we can do some cost engineering on on how we're how we're using Chris's services. John, you were going to get you were going to foil. Well, it, it, I foiled it, it's, and it's been received. I haven't gotten the data yet. It's in the process of getting the data. Okay. But that's going to be up to whenever I get the data. Yeah. Nothing after that. No, I'll we'll get data from 1990 to. Yeah, but the other today. data will be available. The DEC data is always available. You just have to foil them now. One one reason Chris was doing that, and he sort of talked about it in his presentation, is to compare to DEC data and to try to perhaps see if his data conflicts with theirs and his is more favorable. Maybe there can be a little bit of a dialogue to get an area open. No, and I really may agree have some with that. value, yeah. but I think also I think we need to sort of look at where it's being tested and make sure it's being tested close enough to a DEC test station so that that's viable. Yeah. I don't think the DEC stuff like that. Yeah, the, the, the fecal coliform data is not really a big cost factor. I don't think. I don't know. They come, they do the sample, they work it up in the lab. Yeah, I, there's I think there's the import, people time involved in yeah, it. Yeah, but I think the important thing we want to do is, is, the, is the DNA testing. Right, that's, that's, the that's what the question missing. was, can we do the DNA testing? The micro, uh, micro, uh, microbial, oh, I can't say the word now. <laughs> microbial. <laughs> microbial source, yes. That was specifically asked by the APC committee. Well, where, where is this? At the northern end they want. They, because we only do it right now at the culvert, area. so they don't feel that that's can, giving them the a real the test result. Yeah, that's, I think, where the they, we have all the, yeah. We have all the, we can get the DEC data analyzed for that, too. Okay. Well, well, I think it would, I got to tell you, I think it would be beneficial for both, okay, for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is Chris's goals at sort of going back and, and, and nudging the DEC on some of their closure areas, but also in the case of Akabonic, we do have that culvert, okay? We've been using Chris Goldler's data to substantiate our per, the permitting for keeping that culvert open. And you know what? It would be nice to see something, what the impacts of that culvert, of the culvert are, open, have on the northern What impact well, it might be having the, on the coliform that's counts. The reason, if you're getting this well, That's the reason data, I got all this DEC yeah, data. I think that's great. Because that's going to give us a lot of before yeah, and information after. and after information. And before it was built. And then it was opened, and then it stopped being opened, and then it was reopened. So there's yeah. going to be a lot of points in there. I'm not sure if who's qualified to analyze that. Well, but. I think that we're already paying somebody that is qualified. Do you think it would be beneficial to have a meeting with Chris and yeah. then to ha sit down and chat with him about what he's what what we would like to have happen, and then what he is can. Pro Provide to us, and then we ha dis up discuss it. it and then decide. Oh, but also, Pussy's pond. Right, I know. I'd like, so, yeah, I'd like weeks, to make so a we... motion now to accept his proposal and expand our testing. We, we can I've, work I've, out yeah, my just another uh, yeah. area I'd like to discuss, if that's all right, sure. Jim, before we go too much further. I, I agree with you in principle, but in the, the head of Three Mile Harbor has been an area that's been really a, a hot spot. Mm -hmm. And I learned something this week that I didn't know is that there are several <coughs> outflow pipes along the bulkhead right. um, by the, the town Moraine area. Right. I know there was, there was always one that I was you know, there's, there's familiar with. There's a whole, whole series of them. It's drainage. Yeah. And uh, they're creating a lot of uh, kind of a foamy output, mm -hmm. which tends to indicate protein. Right. So 
I don't know how he's testing the head of the harbor, but well, Sokides is, you know, we know Sokides is a hot mm -hmm. spot, and now that I understand there's multiple inputs coming in along the bulkhead, both to the south and the east, well, should we not be taking a closer look mm -hmm. there too? That's another thing I didn't quite understand uh, reading the report is specifically where the tests are being done. Because yeah. if, if they're if going out in a boat and they're doing it sort of in the middle of the basin, at mm -hmm. the head of the harbor, that's one thing. But if a guy's coming to the edge of the bulkhead and dipping right near that. The outflow pipe. Yeah. And I, I saw in you that uh, a couple of weeks ago, three guys. Yeah, and those are the kinds of things I think I'd yeah. like to talk to. I don't know where the pipe was, was but they, they were yeah. definitely taking sure it from we have the bulkhead. sites in certain areas. So what, why, don't we, why don't we vote tonight to um, renew and expand the testing? and we'll work up a, a list of what we want them done. Yeah, at least let them get started on what he can. Yeah, because we do have this proposal for 2019, so we should respond to that. And he wants He's, to get going in April. Yeah. Right. And then would you like me to contact him to bring him in to meet with us so that we can all have a discussion and then Maybe go from there? We should just try and decide where we want the test sites to be. Well, in addition, do we want to keep them where they have been? Because yeah. we should have a continu well, continuation. Well, I don't know. I think that's the Or the Three Mile Harbor. We have we a committee. One from a committee you know, if, really if it's going to mess up his whole presentation or we, year to year, then that's one thing. But if it can be... You know, he's doing it right off the bulkhead, and it'd be more advantageous to walk yeah. out to the end of the dock or Let's something like yeah. that. Or to have one at Sokai's and one at the bulkhead. Yeah. Right. So bulkhead yeah. I will contact sites, him like about having a discussion ball. about location sites. <coughs> right? But do we want to vote tonight that we yeah. continue yeah. on with 2019 yeah. and go forward with at least what we have? I'll second Jim's motion. All in favor. Okay. Aye. 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 Good. On the topic of water quality testing, I was approached by the members of the Sag Harbor uh, Harbor Management Committee. Mm -hmm. They are planning to continue testing in the western side of Northwest Harbor, inside the breakwater, and up in the coves. And they were wondering if we would consider participating Continuing. again Continuing. at the same level as last year. Well, question I have related to that is where did our suggestions on the uh, on their waterways law. waterways law go? I think it's a nice opportunity to revisit that discussion, Jim, and okay. we should table my suggestion yeah. until we uh, okay. have an opportunity to maybe I chat. I was thinking chat of perhaps condition it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how about we table that one until next <laughs> meeting and we'll get a, do a little more homework on that one. Okay, question going back to Gobler. When I contact him in another email, and it does take him sometimes weeks to get back, so it may not even be it. Do I want him to come into a meeting uh, do before we want us? Him in a full or, trustee meeting, or do we want to do just? Or do we want to do an office thing where you have the? Yeah, I'd prefer an informal, the, personally. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so now we can also. You're into being on the committee. Do you need another? Yeah. Well, so we, we can also we have go to Southampton. That, that's being considered, right? The yeah, Three Mile and Akabonic, I think, are the two hot spots yeah. we're talking about. And what about Pussy's Pond? That's 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 okay, but that's uh, that is to be considered. Yeah. That's another body of work. Okay. Um, all right. I will contact him and see, and we can also go to his office if it's it, more convenient for him. I, it, well, I'm just. Well, I don't know. Yeah. No. No. Go ahead. Can I try to tell you? Let's not make that offer. Okay. I'm just it's wondering if Pussy's Pond yes, is itself is the place. I mean, or, or is out ecosystem. in that. Arm, a better place. Isn't that pussy pond work still going on? DEC was working on their side. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's the, a lot of activity the, up there. The, the other side's done about that they re, uh, reconstructed. The yeah. The so somebody must have levels, I would yeah, think, yeah. readings. Well, or I just saw the DC data for the sampling they did on the 17th, and their station they have near Landing Lane was. 93, and every other station in Akabonic was less than three, and the cutoff mm -hmm. is 14. So that's a, it's a hot spot, but it's hot outside of Pussy's Pond. It's, obviously, well Pussy's Pond is uh, must hot. be off the charts. Yeah. yeah. Is that coming from the school? We got, that's no, they determined it's coming from the north from the north end. I think we should do the DNA test in Pussy's Pond. Yeah. All right. 
But yeah. I don't, those are the kinds of things I'd yeah. like. My understanding is it's coming from gardeners across, and not so much the, from the school. That's where the water. No, shed. you mean. Well, now they've got all those bio flowers. swells so over. Well, from all, across. All yeah, there's gardeners around right Pussy's, there. If in the frontal part of Pussy's Pond. Yeah. So the water quality should be changing, should be Well, that's what I'd like to, can I tell you, Del, that's what I'd like to know. Yeah, well, sure. You we don't know. have preliminary data, yeah. unfortunately. Well, well actually, anybody, there is data out here that, yeah. that, that, that the town collected. Yeah. You know, we talk about sixty grand here. You know, uh, we're not. We don't have deep pockets. And I had asked um, earlier if some of um, these costs could be uh, shared through the CPF uh, monies, and they, nobody has. No, they don't. Anything do, they, they, they don't do any. They, they specifically won't won't uh, fund. won't fund studies unless they're specifically attached to a project. Well, and that can be done, I would think. I mean, that might sure. that might just you know uh, entail a little more research and uh, you know making that a uh, reality because yeah, we're, well, well, remediation, remediation is, is the next step. We to could, they won't just come in a logical to determine next whether, step to some of this research. You know, the reality right. is we can put in a proposal from ourselves. It's not going to go anywhere. I mean, they, they want to fund big projects. But the Akabonic And I think if you had a water quality project, it wouldn't just be a trustee project. It would have to be some kind of a... Connected to an actual... Yeah. Yeah. At, at the last meeting we were at the Akabonic Protection Committee, there were discussions about trying to... Trying to Put an application in from them to get studies funded because they were right. going to be part of the spring school. Right. Um, yeah, it has to be directed uh, to a specific project. situation yeah. as I opposed to just trustees want to see what the water is. Do you do you have any um, do, background or insight into potential remediation in the head of Three Mile Harbor? I know there was talk about some barriers going in. We're going to, they were talking about putting the um, move forward on that. I mean, you're familiar with it now. There's, there's a huge plume of water that just runs down there. It's almost like an underground river. Right, right. The, uh, Kim and Natural was they're going to put a reactive barrier in there. That along that the bulkhead? Along that bulkhead. That takes the nitrogen out of the, out of the water. I know there was talk about it. I didn't know if it was moving No, forward it's, it's, it's moving Slowly along. moving forward. Yeah, it's, and okay. we they're doing a couple, of, a couple yeah. of different sites with that, right? Was you know, we we own the bottom. Babe's Lane and mm -hmm. oh, the Babe's Lane and down. we own the bottom land on behalf of the commonality, but the, we don't own the water. It's a common. I, I'm looking at it as a common goal partnership with the town to help us with these expenses. You know, uh, the constituents, town board trustees, they're swimming, they're fishing. You know, I don't think it's... Uh, no, I, I'm not saying you know, it's not doable. I'm just yeah. saying if it came from the trustees themselves, they'd say, where's the rest of the town? So I think the first step is to have... The trustees would have to get together to partner. with natural resources, probably, and well, develop if, some kind of a common, mm, larger framework. program yeah. mm -hmm. to put to CPF. I, I, so well, I, I think going to CPF is putting the car. Okay, maybe so. Course. But like, for example, uh, what do we pay out of pocket to monitor the water quality with Dr. Gobler at Georgica Pond? Let's say it's $30,000. I'm just throwing a number out. You know, shouldn't Georgica Pond be absorbing some of that? They're paying the bulk they're paying of it. They're paying a lot of it. Well, they're doing, yeah, they're doing yeah, the way more than we are. Yeah. Forget that. The <laughs> <laughs> no, right here, there's a, there's a cooperation no, here yeah. that's missing. Well, you know, yeah. it's yeah. missing. the Economic Protection, the protection the Committee up. could kick in some money to yeah. pay for well, extra you know, money. Well, through membership. Okay. Through membership. But they don't have enough in their bank. My understanding okay. of the really CPF don't. is that if we come up with a project that has a means and an end, right. they would consider it. But we can't just go and say we want to test. That, that we, they we won't, won't even talk to you. Yeah. We right, it has to be connected to a project. That's test. why. If you know what you want to do with it, and what where where it's heading, then we can do that. It's obvious what we're trying well, to but do. But you have to have something concrete. You have to present a project. Sag Harbor, Sag Harbor got funding from the CPF. They came to them with a bioswale project. Um, what else were they doing? They were doing something else in the harbor area there. 
but but they had it all laid out. This is what we want right. to do. Right. Yeah. It was, was there it was also a lot the of rain, on and, and they rain got their money. water and runoff remediation. That was yeah. really their main. So focus. hopefully, when the time comes and it's appropriate, we can do the same. Yeah. Okay. Correct. But studies are not there. That, you know, right. there's a bias against just studies, the studies for the sake of for the studies. Sake of studies no. And and what, so that's not what have we're to come about. Up with a task. Right. You know, yeah, something to. We're doing the study to clean up the water, yeah, so the clams and, and and all the critters that we like to eat are edible, and you know, people's dogs aren't going to get sick. I agree sick. with you. It's just a little more ambiguous. They like to be specific about a project. Yeah, they know what's going on. How could they not? You'd have to have your head in the sand. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> In the um, All right. What's next? Committee reports. Lazy Point, Nat Pete. Request to close out trustee permit. I, I got the paperwork on that. I called Jim Walker. If he wasn't available to meet just yet, they do have the attached photographs. From the photographs, everything looks all right. But you know what? I do want to stop by and before we do that have a look at it so, so I'll make arrangements sometime this week or next week to do so we're that. going to table that I'd like to table that okay um, yeah. also we have a very nice thank you letter from Chris Cohan on behalf of the Victor D'Amico Institute for our support mm -hmm. on um, the historical designation of their structures thank you thanks Chris thank you, thank you. and I think thanks for waiting when it's appropriate we should take Chris up that. on his offer to yeah I thought that was a good offer meeting. Chris by the way the what what was it in the letter Chris oh, yeah. makes an yeah. offer that we hold a meeting we should look for the appropriate time yeah it's a beautiful space yeah. take him up on it. great atmosphere all right and let's finish up with administrative can, can I can oh, go, you sure, one, one, one quick observation I went down, I got called by Village of East Hampton um, uh, police uh, about a deer that was down on the beach. It was at 199 Lily Pond Lane. Broke its leg on the So I went there. No, went close, close. So I went there, and I got to say, I was surprised to see that the toe of the bluff was 50 feet from the water. We measured it. Yeah. It was. So, it was like. There was no. And you know, at first, my first reaction was, "This is ridiculous." And then I said, "Then I re realized it doesn't matter. The first storm that rolls through is going to wipe out this dune away." The problem was, and the reason I'm bringing this up, is this: the fencing is so far out onto the beach. It 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 visually. When you're standing there lining it up, it just looks odd that everyone else is so far back. And they're doing sand fencing and revetment yeah. as well. The problem was the deer was running down the beach. He hit this friggin' fence so hard, mm. he broke his neck and flipped over the fence. Mm. Okay? It just seemed, it just seemed like it was a little excessive on the fence. I know I'm not. I, I, we're not going to go shorten the fence, but I just thought it well, looked kind of odd. It 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 did seem it was a bit excessive. I know it's going to get shortened, roll through a first storm, but it just saddened me a little bit. You know, I, I'm the wildlife guy. It just saddened me a little bit to see that now our beaches. It's bad enough the habitat around the town is 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 diminished uh, is decreasing for for our wildlife now our beaches are getting smaller as well and, and i'm not making that a blank i guess i am making that a blanket statement well, but but look I, i'm just trying to look out for for our wildlife as well not asking us to do anything i just found it odd and if you go look at it geez how i mean there's a four by four post sticking in the middle of the sand in front of the sand fencing almost like here's our real marker but we decided to put the fence just back six more inches mm -hmm. we're just leaving that there to let you know our property ends here mm. and if the thing stands eight foot high it's a four by four with a orange painted tip on it so airplanes don't friggin hit it yeah. it's it's big and it's out of place and it's 
It's not part of the sand fence. Well, it's and it's if it's out in a, in the beach, it doesn't belong there. So that should right. be removed. It should. They're just to you know not. I'm not trying to support one thing or another, but they we asked for the double row of sand fencing mm -hmm. when that application came through. I was there when that project started. There was a lot more beach there when the project started. It's Much a tough beach. spot. And you know, when I've seen it where two rows of sand fencing isn't really appropriate, I've asked to just put one row of sand fencing. In fact, I just did that with 215 when they got ready. Remember the property that we looked at right next to the access to Georgia <coughs> Beach there? Right, that's 199 okay. Lily Pond. No, that's 215. Oh, okay. 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 199 mm -hmm. is middle. like two or three doors you're to right. the you're east. Right. You're right, you're okay? right, you're right. Okay? But when that guy got ready to do his sand fencing, he called me up and said, hey, I got to tell you, have you been down here? He says, the beach has gotten a little narrow. And he says, I'm afraid if I do two rows, it's going to push the fencing out too far. And I just said, hey, you know what? I appreciate the phone call. I did see it. Just do one zigzag row down there. And at the point that the beach builds up where you can safely do it, we'll do the other row. Because, you know, you can kind of think on your feet. But when they did that, the beach wasn't quite as narrow, but in all honesty, that beach was getting narrow when they finished that job because they had trouble getting sand down to some of the projects farther to the east there because the beach had narrowed up so much. Jim, the, the part that you you, you're mentioning yeah. the zigzag in the fence, and now I'm, re, uh, I'm recalling that, that the part of the fence the deer hit wasn't what it came from the top of the bluff it was one straight fence that comes down on both sides of the property. Yeah, and then there's a zigzag at the bottom. Huh. But the fence that the deer hit is the was, fence going from the beach well, up that, the hole, right up to the top of the property, well, up first, the bluff. First and foremost, let's get one thing straight. And it's a single straight, straight get, line. Was it running let's on get the beach? one thing straight. We only permit the stuff that's on our property. We didn't permit the two... I'm going to call it on the, the property line markers. Borders. It didn't look right. Fence, it didn't look fences. Right. And I'm glad you bring it up. I can check that out yeah, with the village. Because yeah. that's not our that's, jurisdiction. Yeah, that is, that's, that's Billy Hayjack and, uh, and Kenny Cullum. But I'll does it have far, does it come down onto the beach or is it still comes on to, their property? Yeah, it comes so it, down. Insert, it encompasses the entire lot line then? Yeah, it sounds like on both sides the and the front? Line. Yeah. Seems unusual. Yeah, yeah the pretty, whole the whole be thing almost was unusual, that's and that's, that's why. Did you take a picture of it? You know, I, I know did, you're too busy with I the deer. I did. No, I oh, took the sorry. picture after the fact. I went back and took the picture. Do you um, have it? I don't. I, oh. That's what I did. I put okay. it on my computer when I took pictures off my. I accidentally took it off my phone. Okay. So it's on my computer. So are you now. saying that the fence comes straight down, and then the yeah. zigzag is inside the? Yeah, it's like two border lines. He's saying two. To be quite honest, no Francis, fencing, I don't no. remember any zigzag at all. I remember just, the fence just coming straight down and straight across, making one big box. Hmm. Yeah, that one. That no, that's yeah, not. That's, that's the way I saw it. That's the way I recall it. And I know now the bottom, I'm not 100%, but I am about the sides because that's where the deer hit it. He well. hit a straight fence. Mm -hmm. And it was only one one strip of fence, and it was straight. So we've down given to the a permit beach. for the beach side, but not obviously well, we, we don't give no, a permit on, for the side. Hang on, hang well, on. I'll run. You know what? They'll, I'll run down there tomorrow. Just look check. at it yeah. because if it's not like the the like we <clears> described, <throat> mm -hmm. okay, it doesn't belong there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll we're gonna we'll. But we don't we don't give more. permits for for no, snow fencing no, on the no, corner and we don't. Houses. And you know what it is? So we're not going to give we're not going to give a permit for upland snow fence, right. period, because it's not in our jurisdiction. No. It's not our, it's, that's not our baby. That's the village. Needless to say. Okay. Brent, I have one quick thing. I'm sorry, yeah. I'll keep it brief. I know it's been a long meeting. But uh, back to the, the Sag Harbor Village jurisdiction, they are going to be releasing a more complete draft of the new waterways law, and I thought everyone might like to look at it. So mm -hmm. I, Good. I've been sent one document, and there's a couple more, I believe, forthcoming, and I think they're going to talk about it further on May 14th. I'd like to get it before everyone else, just so you can see sure. what's going on over there and be a little more in the loop. There are some changes that some of the residents on the East Hampton side were a little concerned about, and they'd like us to see it. So I'll get that over to you guys. Okay. Thank you.
Um, if we continue, I just have to ask. If we, I know. If we continue with the project, will we be doing the same setup that we did last year with um, the trustees being in charge of? I don't know. We don't it know yet. Okay. It hasn't been decided. Okay. All right. Can I just add something real quick? <laughs> so out there. <laughs> This is the boater's guide that we had in our office, which is really outdated. The uh, pump out facilities and restrooms and garbages facilities. Um, I spoke to Ed Michaels about this. He's gonna help me update this whole mapping and really pinpoint what's there, what's not. He said there's a lot of these pump out facilities basically have never had a pump out facility that has been operational. Um, so we're going to update this. Um, he's, I'm going to work with him on that, and, and then I'm going to see about getting a new brochure made up so we can distribute to the public. Maybe okay. put at the, all the marinas and so people have this information. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. Good. Thank you. Um, administrative payment of the bills. East Hampton Star, $85.03. Ready Fresh. Four dollars and ninety cents. I have no idea. Ready fresh? Sounds yeah. like food. No. <laughs> That's the water. Oh, okay. <laughs> First coastal, eight hundred dollars for opening of Georgica Pond and six thousand dollars for the dredging fee for the sand that went to the Georgica Association. Is that how was that how it was worked in the uh... instead of deducting it from what? Okay. They paid yeah. us with doing a transaction. So okay. it's all That's fine. on the up and up. And Steve Borner, five hundred dollars. Is that Steve's? Is that the completion? Or That's his final payment. Final. 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 We gave him yeah. five mm -hmm. before, last mm -hmm. time, and now we give him the rest this time when it's completed. I'll make a motion to pay the bills. I'll okay. second. All in favor? Third. Aye. 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 All right. Minutes, February twenty-fifth. I read both of them and sent them in uh, last week. And the February twenty-fifth, I sent in some time ago. So I. May, whatever corrections I made, I submitted to. Um, we should know what those corrections are. They, well, before the we ones go. I sent were incorporated into the minutes. We Do you have, have the no. corrections by chance? The ones I sent, I don't know. If I, yeah, yeah, I mean, let's if you guys are I making have. minor, uh, you know, corrections. I think they were. Here's February 25th, I think 26th. I Usually when I, I do this, I, type, I extrapolate the sentences and then send it in. And um, Arlene watches the program while she's checking to make sure that everything is copacetic. So, so these have the I did this a while ago. I'm, I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. no. I'm not certain. I have a feeling yes, only because I printed them out before the meeting. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to be difficult, but no, if it's anything like other than just a... A, you know, a grammar issue, um, you know, if it one, reflects on the body of, which of, one? of the, the sentence. Yeah, we okay. need to know no, that. No, the one thing I did, Watch I put in John's name, um, he was omitted from making a pre- That's not a big deal. You know, so I yeah. added John's name to give him big credit. Big me. What? Oh, I didn't mean that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm and the was, funny guy. It was good. actually attributed to only me, and I said no. No, but something is like John. that is fine. I don't make a motion that. to accept the minute. Okay, I'll right. second it. All in favor? Right. I'll abstain. Could I I'll ask something? That reason. My, mine's not in there. Yeah, I, there was, was a thing in there that you, are, you had put I'm sorry, I on you the rules something. committee. You had made a statement that night about um, advising the board that you had spoken to Mr. Hanks and he had agreed to put that gate on his property okay. and I thought okay. that was really important to have in there sure. and it's which not in there so I'm which not voting for the minutes which I will state? well hold on so state. we should get which which February 25th okay, okay. Let me the, the, the the six pole so highway we, thanks at six pole so highway we can table the 25th and, and yeah, I was yeah. Gonna yeah. I'm sorry I didn't realize that yeah. Yeah. is that March 25th no, February. 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 February 25th way back March 25th I haven't had a chance to review yet why don't we table them both then yeah, well, right. It sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Does anybody well, have anything else? Yes, I do. Oh, wait, just yeah. one thing. It's so not on the But I just wanted to bring this up because... Wednesday night. Is yeah. that Bruce. I thought we had Bruce at 5 o'clock. March 25th. I, let's hold off. Yeah, hold off on that. Okay. I just want to split up. And um, we, can I just add this one little thing? Because we, we do have education. We didn't have it on tonight's okay. meeting, but we are going. We got our so thing. I'm against it. Right. So Thank you. No, I just don't work. Okay, Susan has one more thing. One more thing. It's school. School time. Education. School marm. We, we got moved um, for, to Emma Gensett School toward the end of the month um, with the shellfish hatchery, Ashley Oliver. 
And I was just wondering, because I have had this around, are we doing anything about our Captain Rysom Scholarship Fund with a new um, uh, banking situation to earn interest on what we have? We, can, have we, we decided? Could. Or can we address this next time? At our next meeting? Um, that was what I presented, and others were supposed to look into other uh, Okay, so I guess my question is, has other anybody else looked at I any other seen anything banks? So we're next still meeting. in the CD. That's, oh, that's you. Okay. So, excuse me. Rick, I, I didn't even remember at, who was. I, I, I don't at, know if it was me, but I, 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 I remember you were I'm not part of this. To discuss You're it. not prepared. Okay. So maybe next in our next meeting, maybe next we meeting. could have some address of this. CDs is still there. It, yeah, no, I know. But since I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. Oh, and one more thing. Captain Rice, some applications for the scholarship fund. There are about 10 of them this year. I picked them up from the school. I've read all of them. Uh, they're the very, Did you they're in the office. Yeah. I, no, you know what? I can't. I have. I haven't decided. Okay. I thought I did. But I that did. process is there, right? When did they there? Okay. Okay. there? Do they have to be? Read them. Um, submitted when, when, By when? yes, um, now, uh, I think it's What's May, I'm going to say, I'm going to say May 10th, but don't hold me to it because I don't have it right in front of me now. It's in the office. Is it the 15th? Is it the 15th? I'm not sure. I'm going to say 10 then just to be sure right now. Yeah. So if you can get down this week and yeah, read it them is and a lot. vote, that'd be great. The, last year we only had five. This year I think it's about 10 and they are pretty 11. 11? Okay. So they're very, um, you know, lengthy, and I okay. suggest that, yeah, they're interested. And, and you know why? Because Susan's effort and my tagging along going to the schools. You're not tagging along. Um, you know, we're getting the word out that, hey, there's some money to be had here. So tell us what you think about your town and the trustees. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, I think so. we've so. done a good okay. job. Can someone make a motion? I'd like make a motion. motion. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. All in favor. You. <laughs> All in favor. Thank you for my fish. Jim, will you follow me home? Aye. Aye. <laughs> uh, can you watch?